Microphone access. I'm really looking at it, feeling like I'm in here judging you. Well, I do feel like you're judging me. Uh, okay. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, guys. Thanks oh. for <laughs> stopping by the Black Side Industry Podcast. User disconnected from your channel. Uh, we got a couple lingers here on the channel, but they seem to be going now. Uh, today we got Blue Jake Forty Two, our guest last time. He's here again today, and we also got a new guest, Howdy. Upper Echelon Gaming, uh, as a YouTuber talks a lot about the gaming industry and. We got a lot to talk about today, guys. So I'd like to have Blue Drake, if you could introduce yourself, and then uh, Echelon. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm, my name is Blue Drake. I'm a YouTuber. Although I'm not sure if anybody who's a YouTuber calls themselves a YouTuber anymore. An influencer, streamer. I don't know how you describe it. Um, and uh, I've been making videos on tactical games as well as uh, doing some of our own in-house like mods and development work and stuff for the past couple of years. That's me. <laughs> Echelon. Um. Uh, I'm just a YouTuber. I guess I'd call myself a provocateur and a commentator. I uh, got into gaming a couple of years ago and sort of rolled with the punches. And now I'm here talking about stuff that's relevant to monetization, primarily, you know, tackling topics of predatory practices and really hit home with that. So that's me. Fantastic. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about a lot today, guys, is we're, we're going to kind of go into a lot of like the anti-consumer uh, practices that a lot of the AAA companies that we've known throughout the years to be releasing the the biggest and best games that we know um, have been kind of slowly dwindling and really starting to integrate a lot of like either pay to win microtransaction features that are just really against what gaming is kind of about in 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 our opinions. Um, and because I, I remember back in the day when like you know. I don't know, maybe like back in the day, it sounds weird, like 10 years ago, let's say, where a lot of the games that were coming out were more or less complete. They, you know, weren't uh, almost like these early access kind of games where they weren't uh, fully functional, either in like netcode performance, optimization, or even features. Um, and like the, the games, they just felt like games. You bought your game and it's like, all right, here's my full product. And now it's like they're selling it to you in bits and pieces. And like part of that is like the little tiny crumbs that they try and incentivize you to go buy with these microtransactions. And, uh, we're going to go into that quite a bit. Um, what what games have you guys recently seen uh, who, who, that are kind of doing these kind of uh, anti-consumer purchasing methods? Oh, it's a long list, man. <laughs> if, you go, if you go down the wormhole of early access and that whole you know, debacle going on with Atlas, that's number one. Number two would be Red Dead Redemption 2 online with the whole microtransactions in beta, mm -hmm. especially the pricing. Number three would be Activision coming out with the the microtransaction store after the review cycle has completed, which is something I think is going to be popularized by them. And we're going to see that in increasing amounts. Um, off the top of my head, those are the first three. It looks like Anthem's going to be free of that and maybe steering back in the right direction, but there's it's probably going to get worse yet. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I, do, I do have my concerns about Anthem. I feel, I feel like it's going to be one of those uh, very beautiful, pretty animated games, but not a lot of depth, kind of a grindy loot and shoot. That's pretty much it. That's that's my concern. probably des. It's like a it's like a Destiny competitor, yeah. right? Like I yeah. feel like that's what it's made to be. Yeah. Yeah, you got like these mech robots and stuff. It does look yeah. very good though. I will say the game looks gorgeous. Um. So about um the way that these uh, I guess I don't even really publishers, marketers, whoever whoever is the one really making the decisions about these uh. Like a little microtransactions, they really seem like they're just so out of touch with their audience and, and giving them what they want. You know, how would you guys go about this? Like, what, what, what would be the root cause of the problem? Well, I guess the first thing to ask is, uh, is there any forms of, like, microtransactions or anything like that that, you, that you've seen that you are okay with? Or, like, any ways of monetizing? Fortnite? Um, Fortnite? Okay, I was actually going to say that as well. I think that's so. I'm going to say I I think the main motivation for this is because studios are trying to build passive income sources. Right. Um. I think this is I and I think this is just uh, not not to keep going back to the same product uh the to, to the same argument, but I think this is a uh, product of the same situation that's causing team. a lot of other uh, stress throughout the industry and I think that that's uh, the the industry and, and the market kind of peaking out right now obviously we've seen that massive crash which has happened recently um, we've seen uh, a lot of um, saturation and I've actually I uh, I saw a report um, a couple of weeks ago that actually showed the 
uh, net Steam sales uh, also versus the number of games that are actually on the Steam store. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of parallels with the music industry. Um, and you see a lot of the same business practices to counter that. And I think in a market where everybody is really struggling in order to keep a long-term business sustained, right now, uh, I think passive income or recurring income um, is the name of the game. And I don't think that's necessarily something that people should be faulted for, but at sure. the same time, I think that pursuing that responsibly and pursuing that in a way that's friendly to your audience and your player base is what makes a lot of sense. Because when you think about it, even even Twitch and streamers, one of the reasons that I think we've been able to survive in this climate so well is because we were ahead of that game. We were focusing on passive income. We were focusing on perpetual income before a lot of the game development studios were. And I think now, now that they've kind of been in this market that's peaking and crashing and then they're going through the rapids right now, uh, I think it's funny because... They're all being like, "Oh shit, why weren't we thinking of that?" You yeah. know, and now, now they're kind of getting desperate, being like, "Oh well, shit, how do we do this?" Uh, and I think that's why they're making a lot of mistakes because they're they're kind of like scrambling, trying to do the same thing that a lot of the influencers have been doing properly for a long time. Right. And I think it's just, I think there's a little growing pains to be had there, but I think with enough conversations of how to do it right, hopefully they'll start doing it right. Yeah, um, it but makes, unfortunately, I don't wonder, think it's going away. It makes me wonder because like I. I remember when games were supposed to be developed because like we're like we're trying to make this awesome product and like it's the game that mm -hmm. we're trying to sell and it's the game that keeps people coming back it's like you're wanting to sell this amazing experience that will constantly generate revenue because the game will stay popular you know you release expansion or dlc for it i mean that's kind of another mm -hmm. discussion i mean a lot of developers they'll release dlc for like you know 9.99 and it's really just a skin or just like a cosmetic mm -hmm. um or they'll uh, they'll claim it's an expansion pack of some kind, but it doesn't really expand much upon the game. It maybe adds some assets, a couple other guns, or something like that. Um, mm. and like what I remember, an expansion. If you add an, ex an expansion to the game, it's it's adding on to the game's like major elements, like either story, design, gameplay. You're adding in a bunch of new elements that weren't in the previous game. Um, and I feel like a lot of these people, whoever are making these decisions, have very much lost touch or were never in touch with gamers to begin with. And they're looking at it as a, how can we make this self-sustainable uh, kind of um, uh, product that um, we can continually generate that revenue from for, through like microtransactions and so on and so forth. I mean, I, like, well, like I said, I think Fortnite does it a really good way because it's just these cosmetic skins. They don't cost a ridiculous amount of money. They just to look cool and you got like little taunts and like little flares and shit like that that just look cool and kind of set yourself apart as an individual in the game. And, you know, that's something mm -hmm. that I feel like all people want in life. Everybody wants to kind of be an individual in one way or the other. Um, and that's not really anti-consumer because that's what they want. They're like, you know, I don't want to look like the default skin guy. I want to kind of look unique. That's cool. And that gives, you know, players the freedom to do that. And I wouldn't really say that's an anti-consumer practice. And that is also another good way for, you know, you to continually generate revenue off of a game. And plus, you know, with Fortnite being free to play, they have no other way to generate revenue. They're not trying to get people to buy their game. They just want people to play it, get into it. And then if they like it enough, they'll spend the extra money on the skins. And generally, mm -hmm. more, one person would probably spend more money buying skins in a game than they would just buying the game in general. Uh, so it's actually pretty yeah. smart. Um, but then you, you got like... Uh, you know, the gold uh, in Red Dead Redemption 2, I watched your uh, video, Echelon, and the gold, it, you can't even fucking use it. It's just like you buy it, and it just sits there, and it's just like, okay, I can use this later, but I bought it now, and they have your money. You know what I mean? If you could go into uh, a lot of these other practices that are just, um, just shady, I guess. They're just anti-consumer and shady. You know, it's yeah, like, uh, the thing about Red Dead Redemption 2 is that they, they had to backtrack on blatant pay-to-win. So then once they removed the fact that you could get this advantage over everyone else by spending $100 on gold, then it kind of fell apart, right? The system doesn't function anymore. And to speak a little bit about your point about Fortnite, uh, it absolutely is possible to monetize games in a aggressively better way for the consumer while still getting their money. Mm -hmm. um, one of the examples I frequently like to use is Grinding Gear Games with Path of Exile. In that yeah, game, I, game, I have some gripes with how much they cost, but in that game, if you spend some money, you can look really cool. I mean, you can yeah. really deck your character really? out. And I Vanity think that's sells. a good example. Yeah, Vanity sells. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's possible to do. People want. 
Because mm -hmm. I think also Path of Exile is such a good example because since it's based off of Diablo, um, it's one of those games where they could have done those pay-to-win tactics. Like, if there was any game where that is something where it is most a concern, a game like Path of Exile is absolutely a place where that could be a big concern. But I think they took into consideration that it would be a big concern if they made that kind of game play to win and that it would kill the player base, mm -hmm. and they found a really good middle ground that is both effective while also protecting the player base from these uh, unfair business practices that affect the gameplay. Right. Um, and I think, I think that's definitely something to, to look at. Um, I think those are good examples that more people should follow. So I think, I, I think unfortunately, we're in an era right now where the microtransaction uh, and the, the free-to-play and the, the, these kinds of business models, they're definitely not leaving. If, anywhere, if anything, they're going to continue getting more prominent. Um, I think the days of creating a single game for a single uh, fee and then releasing like a DLC or something like that mm -hmm. for an additional like price, I, I don't think that that's going to happen as often anymore, um, I if I, at all. To be because... honest, I, the last game I, I really remember seeing a good amount of DLC for that was like kind of an expansion to the game was like Metro Redux Last Light. And they just added like a, it was like an hour to three hour long side mission where you play one of the extra characters in the game and you get experience like yeah. uh, their little storyline, you know, when, you, when you're going through the main game. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel like a lot of these early access games too, because a lot of the games we're playing now are early access. And like, aside from the few AAA products that are getting released, um, most of the games that are really kind of sweeping the market right now are just early access games, games that are in development. And so like, why would they do DLC for an early access game? Let's actually or... let's actually talk about that because I don't think early this is going to be sound this is going to sound weird. I don't think early access exists anymore. It's I don't just, think any games, of those it's just games. I, they're I, just games. I was going to say That's the same all thing it is about uh Cause... like it reminds me of Battlefield 4. When was, the netcode took a year. Yeah, well, after exactly. It was released so for like it to what is like early a, access? A quality product. Yeah. I I think the, the experience of gaming has fundamentally changed and i think that that's something that people don't take into consideration anymore i think we talked about this in the last podcast i can't remember if we talked about games transforming more into a service than a product uh and i see that trend well, that, happening well, that, more and more that kind of comes into the microtransactions too because it's like a service yeah. that you come in and you, it's a service you pay a fee and yeah and then you, you have to have some kind yeah. of perpetual model or something mm -hmm. like that and i think that that's absolutely what's happening back in the diablo two days back in the battlefield two days and stuff like that um you had to create a product mm -hmm. um and i think there's a lot of i think this is an interesting conversation games because it wasn't then. like every game that was coming out back then was like innovative everything was like oh this is like the next step in gaming well, it's like the next it wasn't thing, just know? that but also, you were forced the, – the business model revolved around creating a product because the logistical infrastructure was there. That was uh, – or, or uh, it wasn't there. Um, back in the day, how, how did you get a game? You couldn't download a game off the internet. Mm -hmm. You couldn't download patches. You couldn't stay connected. You had to – it's not like they were like, oh, hey, let's put games in boxes because that sounds cool. That's the only way that you could get a product, and that – fundamentally transformed the business practices around that as well. It's like, here's a box with the thing in it. It's done. Take it. And then I still remember back in the day, if you were to get a game and it needed a hot fix to be playable, that would kill the review scores because yeah. who's going to go and get a hot fix back then? Uh, that's like, a really that's good point. That's not going to happen. Yeah. And <laughs> nowadays... Nowadays, it's a completely different. It, it's 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 almost like we're not even. It's almost not even a game anymore. It's like they're completely different things. In fact, even when you look at the music industry as well, I feel like music back in the day compared to music now is is more similar than games are. I feel like the way games used to be distributed, the way games used to be played, versus the way games are distributed and the way they're played now, everything is different. Not just the games, the surrounding infrastructure, the logistical aspects well, of how you deliver yeah, games, of how you maintain them. Um, I, I run and, a I run a podcast or not a podcast, excuse me. Oh, well, I do run a podcast, but I run a, a Spotify playlist uh, that you know just over the year just took fucking storm. It's almost at a hundred thousand followers. Uh, it's one of the top non uh, lo fi like playlists on the platform, and I love you know, promoting other, you know, indie artists on there, no different than a stream would, right? If you have a stream that has followers, mm -hmm. people come and watch it. Um, and you know, that's promoting a product. And it's the same thing with music. I always, I'm always looking for these indie artists who are looking for some kind of exposure and I put them on my playlist and they, they get a lot of attraction from it. Yeah. And I think that's something to take into consideration. Like, is it really the developers making a lot of these decisions or is it the surrounding environment that's changing best practices? 
um, and then changing the actual product. And publishers, publishers. yeah, absolutely. Publishers, people just, it's definitely um, the publishers. It's someone like it, from a top-down position who's monetizing the product and making individual decisions that are not based on you know like creative benefit to the gamer. Mm -hmm. They're based on the shareholder bottom line. That's one hundred percent what it is. Here's what I think you guys actually should do a lot more. Um, I think I I actually don't think it's necessarily publishers because the word publisher and and like the the idea of a developer and a publisher has also fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, a publisher used to be completely different. Like the whole idea of having a publisher was to publish something yeah. because you needed a publisher to actually get your product See, on yeah. the sto on a storefront. They're, they're the ones like, who made the, to, the, the, they did all the marketing and promoting. They're the ones who got people. Yeah, to they see they the ma game. they made the boxes yeah. back when boxes actually mattered yeah. being made. Like they got you on shelves back when shelves was a they thing. They got you on commercials and, think, and all that kind of crap. Yeah, exactly. And I think the role of a publisher has changed so much to the point where it's almost lost its definition. There are people who I've seen who call themselves publishers that are really developers, and there's people who call <laughs> themselves developers that are really publishers. And you take into consideration, so like you take into consideration, like. What does a publisher even mean anymore? It's this very like amalgus um, situation where people's roles and definitions and and uh, and and what part they play in a product is is much harder to pin down than it used to be. Right. And I would say what you if you want a certain type of product, if you want a certain type of game, if you want to support a certain type of game, what I would start doing is you need to do research on the people that. Uh, on uh, who who have a hand in that game. You need to take a look at what their skill set is. You need to take a look at what their background is. Because I'll I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that I've seen, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of games that I've seen do certain things that seem kind of ridiculous. And you're just like, oh, who would who would think of doing something like that? What you know what who what? And it's easy to just kind of blame like these these large ideas of of publishers and developers, which don't really pin down the exact problem. But when you actually start looking at the specific people. I still remember there was there was a, a couple of games that I was looking at and I was like, well, why are these people making these decisions? And I looked into the company and the CEO of the company, he wasn't a programmer, he wasn't a developer, he didn't have any he was actually prime he was just in financial management. That's that's all it was. You he know, he was I, from a completely I, different industry. I was talking and to, he came uh, in. I was talking to a buddy of mine uh, who's who's a developer on a game coming up here. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he told me a lot about how he tried he, he was always approached by a lot of these people. Um, who wanted to help make his game, but they knew nothing mm -hmm. about development. They knew they don't know how mm -hmm. to program, animate, you know, even like just asset creation. They knew nothing about development, but they had these, you know, degrees and these qualifications for finance and you know being able to potentially sell a product. Um, but mm -hmm. that's that's not what the game. That's not really what games are about. At least for me, mm -hmm. games games have always mm -hmm. been something about uh, like passion projects. You know, making something mm -hmm. that. You really want to play yourself, and then you know other people just enjoy that product as well. And uh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh no, no, I'm I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Um, I I think there's a lot of examples of of this uh, when you actually started looking into. Uh, the kinds of people that make different kinds of games, the the kinds of decisions. I, I feel like that's what you really should focus on. I, I think if, if you really want to push a specific agenda inside of a market, like if you disagree with a certain kind of use of microtransactions or if you agree with a certain kind of um, if you agree with a certain kind of practice uh, of, of, of marketing games, like for instance, t take into consideration um, uh, you like the original idea of like purchasing a game, and then purchasing like a uh, large, purchasing like a complete game that doesn't have any microtransactions at all, and then purchasing um, maybe like large expansions afterwards or mm. something like that, right? Like, and there's still games that kind of do that. Uh, and when you look at the people behind those games or that lead those studios, it, it makes a lot more sense. So take take for instance, take Squad for instance. Um, Squad is developed, and and the CEO of Squad is is Will Stahl, Merlin. And, and he's somebody that has a military background who uh, became a programmer and loves video games. Well, if somebody's a CEO of a company and has that kind of a background, mm -hmm. that's gonna it, that's gonna reflect throughout the entire product. Absolutely. And when you look at when you look at other games, um, and you you look at the way that other games are made and the people that that lead those kinds of games, especially when you look at sometimes you'll see a game that's made and delivered and built. 
Uh, and the CEO is somebody who's like primarily a business developer or he's primarily uh, uh, he does primarily financial management or he doesn't have a background in video games. And you'll actually see either the game gets sold or somebody swaps out the CEO position and then somebody takes over and, and they're more of a programmer or they have more of like a, a 3D art background or something like that. And you'll see the spirit of the entire company change. And I feel like if you want to really push an agenda, if you really want to fight microtransactions, what you should do is you should find people that represent that idea, not just in what they say, but in their past. And then you, and you look and you see those, the, the kinds of products that those kinds of people create and you support those people. And I think you'll be much, you'll be much happier with the end result. Cause like, let me put it this way, Red Dead Redemption 2. Do you have any idea who made that game? Do you have any idea, like the programmers, the CEO? Do you know who made overtime. those decisions? I know they worked overtime. And, and a lot of those, in, in, in a lot of those situations, they keep that stuff very. They they make that very difficult to figure out. They make that very difficult because once you do understand those kinds of things, it becomes very easy to predict the kinds of stuff that happens. That that's where the warfront is. Like it's an information war in, in that very specific respect. Um, and I think. There's some there's some people bringing up PUBG. I think that's a great idea. When you look at the, in fact, even more when you look at the people that leave, when you people like when uh, when the the best way I've found to figure out the kind of spirit of the company is when times get hard for a company, see who are the first people to get laid off. <laughs> If the first people to get laid off are the artists and the the programmers, it's then not the you probably have a pretty good idea of what kind of company that is and what kind of studio that is. If the first people to get laid off are the business developers yeah. and the financial management people, then you probably have an idea. I mean, there's still it reminds there's me of what happened to Dice, each, dude. How they fired but, like everybody at Dice, like they just fucking canned most of those developers who worked on the original Battlefield series. Yeah, exactly, and and that's the that's the that's the irony because I guarantee you, there's a lot of people who worked on Battlefield that would absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Find those people. Find find those people. <laughs> where are that's you guys all at? I can say. Where are you at? Come Seriously, at me, ask man. that question because that's that some... you, you will you will notice that you that sometimes they'll answer. There's some weird interchangeable executives as well. I mean, you'll notice something like uh, the CFO from Activision Blizzard jumping ship and going over to I think it was Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. So mm. you know you have these. these high ranking executives that are in control of a lot of the different decisions that the company makes that really have absolutely no tie to the game whatsoever. Mm. And they will move on to an unrelated industry at the drop of a hat. They're, they're there to and sell a product, you know, they're not, yeah, they exactly. Don't, they don't care about the product. They're there to just sell something and make money. They're worried about the money. They're worried about the finance, you know, exactly. Mm. And as long as you have top down decision makers that are only really caring about the bottom line and not the actual product and not the gamers experiences, which, I mean, it's a hard thing to change. We can't just swoop in and say, oh, and now all the execs are going to care about making the best game possible. Mm -hmm. But um, as long as that's not the case, as long as all the people in you know control of these projects are motivated by the bottom line exclusively, then I really don't see a way it's going to shift, at least not quickly, for the better. Mm. That makes sense. Leak, I know. I'm kind of a Cliffy pessimist. But... Yeah, he went from Cliff Blazinski, went from Years of War to... I think if you look at Cliffy B, I've... I think um, I think Cliffy B has actually been really consistent, and I think Cliffy B is a situation where you got to keep in mind, Gears of War was not made by a single person. Yeah, you know, yeah. like so you can't say that Cliffy B was, but Cliffy B absolutely played a role in that, and sure. I think that if Cliffy B has the right support structure and the right, because like look at look at Cliffy B's most, I feel like when you look at this stuff from a political standpoint, it makes way more sense um cliffy b's most recent game what what was it it, it had a lot of issues I don't know. that I... people were frustrated with when this fell apart right away radical heights no no not that breakers lawbreakers look at the surrounding aspect of lawbreakers why did lawbreakers exist obviously cliffy b was was in in charge of the product but when you look at the people who were actually investing into the product. When you look at the obligations that he has for the people that were putting forward the money, when you look, I, I believe there was, a, there was a major Chinese company that was actually invested in Lawbreakers. Um, what, was, what was the name of that company? There was, there was some, something there. It, and again, this is the kind of stuff that's kind of hard to figure out. Um, but when you actually look at the surrounding aspects, when you look at the surrounding infrastructure, it makes you wonder. You know, Cliffy B, he, he's probably a kind of guy 
Um, I, I've actually I've met with him. I talked with him during the whole lawbreakers aspect when they were really focusing on marketing and they were bringing people out. Um, and he strikes me as somebody that's just a raw creative. Like he's somebody that it may be a little bit scatterbrained. Um, he, he's a little bit um, exec, eccentric, uh, but at the same time, he's kind of a raw creative. And I feel like when you surround people, when you surround raw creatives with the like with the right kind of infrastructure and the the people who have the right kind of mindsets, you can accomplish something like Gears of War. But when you surround a raw creative with a bunch of deadlines and a bunch of uh, a bunch of like investment that is purely profit driven you know like for instance lawbreakers uh what was was lawbreakers really cliffy b being a raw creative and doing everything that he wanted to do or was somebody else pulling the strings and paying the bills and cliffy b was there to deliver something that was primarily built to appease someone else who was actually writing the checks and when you actually when you start when you start looking at things that way and when you start dissecting things that way the end results start making a lot more sense it's just like a band really when you look at like music bands and stuff like that when you actually track the members or the publishers like the beatles who actually really made the beatles successful a lot of people would say it's the people in the band but it was really like the people who were the 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 secret sauce was their managers and it's not like every single manager is the same it's not like every single publisher is the same mm. it's a very specific person what was his name hold up let me see here beatles manager what was his name uh i think it was brian was it brian i don't really brian epstein or something like that um but there there are behind every great product there is a whole team of very unique individuals that are brought together in a very unique way that can probably usually never be replicated in exactly the same way that specifically affects that kind of result if you bring together a whole bunch of people that have no history making video games that are only interested in following trends and looking at data and saying oh hey like look at lawbreakers why was lawbreakers made Lawbreakers was made was because the hero shooter trend was on the up and up, Overwatch, right? Right. So there was somebody else out there being like, "Oh, hey, oh, Cliffy B, there's obviously a big hero trend. Can you know how to make games, right? Here's a check. Make me, make me a game. Well, what kind of game do you want? I don't know. The the hero. All the kids are talking about the hero shooters nowadays. <laughs> you know, like fucking. That's the, then that's when it starts making sense. Um, like this stuff isn't random. Um, and I feel like like seriously. Let's. I almost want to be like, let's end this podcast and go find these goddamn people that we actually want to, what we want to get. But that's exactly what you should do. Like, go, go on LinkedIn, go on anything, start researching, ask questions, meet the people that make these games, and then ask them questions. The people that ask, that answer your questions the way that you want, the people that seem super passionate, follow them. Fuck everybody else. You know, like seriously, it's the same thing with Battlefield Five. Try to figure out who made Battlefield Five. Oh, They're not going to tell you. Battlefield Five, Battlefield One, Battle. It's a, It's been the same since Battlefield Three for the most part. It's just been slight feature changes, evolution, and it's been the same. It feels the same when I yeah. shoot the guns. They feel the same. It doesn't feel like an. And I guarantee the you, there's people. The I guarantee you, there's people in that studio that want to do something different and oh, they're like oh my gosh i could think of something amazing well, and they keep getting sells. swatted your, your, down your passion and your creativity is not what that guy thinks sells it's not yeah find those Fuck people and follow them when they leave they yeah. don't stay there forever yeah a lot of them are contractors <laughs> yeah. yeah they've annualized so many concepts now like you just spoke to the you know the similarities between all the consecutive battlefields um they've annualized it on a deadline where then you know, it's an unfinished product that they really do have to reskin so many assets. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I doubt that the people behind the screen actually coding these you know, artistic pieces of work, that they're not the ones that are making the creative decisions. They're being told from yeah. the top down, get it out by this time. And to get it out by that time, they have to draw from past work. They yeah. really aren't able to make all new assets. They're not able to make an actual new game. They have to reskin. Right. I'm trying to think how a good a good metaphor for this but battlefield 5 or like the battlefield series games it's almost kind of like youtube rewind or like <laughs> i'm trying to think of another or like maybe i don't know if there's a band out there do you know of any band like a music band where like the members or like blue man group there you go blue man group you think that's the same three guys every single time hell no it is not um they i mean i think that's why they have like 
<laughs> say what? I was just going to say cookie cutter cookie cutter game design. Well, well, so so what you do is you create an idea, right? I mean, it's it's like it's pure corporate. It's like it's like the pure corporate mentality. Battlefield is not any single person. It's not any single team. When you compare it to something like Squad, when you compare it to something like, because uh, even even games like Squad, there, there's people that come and go with that, but they're they're all connected to kind of like a similar kind of like uh, like lineage. Um, but with Battlefield, there 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 is considerably less, if any, anymore lineage. Like, do you think the same people that worked on Battlefield Two are working on Battlefield Four? Fuck no. You think the same people that worked on Battlefield 3 are working on Battlefield like 5? I, I guarantee you that 95% of those teams are getting constantly swapped out. Um, and when you actually take that into consideration, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a corporate shell that you just fill with new people and you just constantly cycle out. It's like, oh, hey, do you know how to make 3D assets? Do you know how to do this, this thing? We have this, we have this very specific structure and we need this, 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 and this person. Doesn't matter who they are. You do these 15 things and bam, we have a new Battlefield game. Yeah. Can you do it or can you don't? They come in, they do it, and then you just swap them out every couple of years. And some of those guys are really talented. They're really good at doing, like, they, they make great assets, they make great artwork. Some of them kind of have, dot, have ideas of how the game could be better, but they don't care. It's a day job. But when they leave that company, they're still making games. They're still doing things. They may not be able to tell you that they even worked on an EA game ever. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, if you're smart enough, you can figure it out. And if you seriously like, go on Twitter, start just combing through, finding these people. Um, we were, t- I think we were talking about this with Battlestate Games the other day. Um, not to get into that whole uh, piece of oh, drama. Battlestate. But, like, Boy. but you look at a lot of those artists and stuff like that. Do you Do you think... Do you think all of them kind of agree with the way that Battle State like works all the time? Like a lot of those guys, like they don't care. They're make they're there to make a fucking gun. Like yeah. they just want to make a gun that looks dope. Yeah. They yeah. don't care about all of this other stuff. Yeah. You know. Um. And when you take that, it, it's the same thing everywhere. When you look at Red Dead Redemption, um. In fact, there's a there's a recent guy uh that contacted me that works that worked at Red Dead Redemption. He's actually looking for contract work now. Let's see what's his uh Brady Art James yes James and he's working uh he he's trying to fill up his uh schedule right now with new uh artwork um but here this is this is public go here do 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 this is a guy that's really cool uh how do I <laughs> this is team speak hey, now so up. there you go I just poked you with it thank you thank you I'm gonna go show this here's a really cool guy this is a really cool guy um He's been hired by a bunch of people that I work with. Oh, he's, uh, he's working, to, on, he's to worked make... on a ton of games. He's worked on a ton of games. This dude has been everywhere. This is one of the guys that I follow. He's really cool. He's uh he's done some work for us, uh, and he's done some work for my friends, and he's done some work for really great big studios. He's a quality artist. Makes some really good. Follow high this guy. So yeah, this look at all good. the pe- look at all the games that he's worked on. He's worked on Hitman Two. He's worked on Red Dead Redemption Two. He's worked on Battlegrounds. He's worked on Insurgency Sandstorm. He's worked on The Force. He's worked on all of this stuff. Um, and and he's he's everywhere. Follow this yeah, what guy. Did, what are you making Sandstorm? Oh, he made a lot of their assets, huh? He made all sorts of stuff, and and he's again, he's not the only person. Um, and and you, you look at Hitman too. Like, do you think he still gets royalties from Hitman? No, of course he doesn't. <laughs> like, I don't not. know. Maybe he does. If he does, he probably can't tell. This is the thing. Like, I'm not gonna. <laughs> he's probably not even allowed to speak for himself. So, so that's the thing. I I'm just assuming that that's the case. Oh, man, but he, he makes tons of shit. Jeez. He makes all sorts of stuff. Um, and he and he's looking to fill up his calendar year right now. So if anybody needs some really high quality AAA assets, hit up James Brady. He'll 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 make some really great stuff. He worked for uh, he did some stuff with CFDs. And this is what I'm talking about. This is does it does it maybe make more sense now? These aren't games. These aren't a singular thing. I think everybody kind of looks at like, oh man, Sea of Thieves. Like, let's all criticize Sea of Thieves as if somebody's even there to listen, you know? But it's not there it's not like there's a team for Sea of Thieves or there's a team for for all of these games. It's this amalgus group of talented people that kind of float throughout and if you really want to start understanding how the game development process works if you really want to start if you really want to start seeing how uh 
w which games are going to be good. Start following these people. Start following the the artists. Start following the people with the good ideas. Start following the programmers. That's, Start that, that's following. Actually, you I, know, I do the same thing. A lot of the games that I'm very interested yeah. in, I talk to the developers, the people who are making the games, so often just because. I'm curious how your product's doing. How, how's how's development? Like, what do you work on today? Like, I'm always so curious and like uh, wanting to know like like each step of the way, like what's getting improved, even if it's a really small small change. It's like I just want to know about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that, that's that's how I've always stayed intrigued. And I used to go to a lot of other websites. I remember going to game trailers when I was younger, and that's where I'd like get all my information. And they're always doing interviews with developers. That's what they did all the time. They'd interview developers and then ask them about mm -hmm. their game and like what's new with their game, what are you working on, all this kind of shit. And uh, there doesn't you're right. There doesn't really seem to be a lot of that anymore. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's really just like here's a commercial with some cringy ass like famous vine youtubers and shit <laughs> and, and the kids will love it and they'll buy it and, oh my god you know it's so uh, and it says not actual gameplay in no. the top left corner and everybody's like it's gonna be so good yeah yeah not even real or like the e3 trailer downgrades those always, those but, always yeah. upset me i don't yeah, want to take like, actually, a hard so left that's turn, another thing but, no, um, no no let's talk about the downgrades the, i want to talk about the downgrades, downgrades? oh my gosh yeah. okay so this is what makes more sense do you think the people that make the trailers are the same people that make the game? No, they no, what? No, oh, no, no way. way. No way. Exactly. Remember what, I actually was, think, what, I remember... take Ubisoft into consideration. I actually think that they have an entire department of just trailer makers. Probably. And they it's the same people that make like they, it's the same exact pie, like I in the same way that you have a game dev studio, I think they have a trailer dev studio. It's hard to figure it out because it's really hard to figure, but from what I know from how I followed, you can actually see, you know, like the Wildlands trailer, the Rainbow Six, the Destiny 2, it's almost like it's all made by the same group of people. And those same group of people like they it's not like they played Wildlands and were like, "Oh, I love Wild like they're just moving on to the next thing." that Ubisoft is telling yeah. them to work on every single yeah, time. And job. it makes so much more sense that way. And I think that's why there's the downgrades. I actually think the reason the downgrades are there isn't because Ubisoft is trying to fool people. It's just the trailer team trying to make the trailer look dope. Yeah. But they don't know anything about the actual development. Like they, They're just making a trailer. They might even get access to the assets. They might even get access to the yeah. build. They might be thinking like, oh man, imagine if we made the, like this look cooler, if we like did this or whatever, and then they make a dope trailer. They show it to whatever CEO. The CEO's like, oh yeah, this looks this cool. But the CEO, looks he doesn't great. care yeah. either. He's not like checking going to be like well okay let's make sure that the people are going to expect that it's the same game like he doesn't care he's like yeah i'll sign off on this this looks yeah. dope and the trailer team's like awesome and, that, and then the development team they don't care enough to even call them out for it because they're just paid to work on it and then you have that's why you have these two separate trailers because you know, it's, and, and, it's uh, made by two separate people to, to kind of hit on the opposite side of that a lot of the developers that i know um for a lot mm -hmm. of these new games coming out they work on their own trailers like the guys who are making the game are working on the trailer and they fucking like they yeah. are such freaks about making sure it's perfect. I remember perfect. Uh, the community manager for Mordhau. Like, it took him, like, three weeks to make a dev blog, and he wanted to make sure it yeah. was fucking perfect. It covered everything that they have been working on so that that way they're informing the community properly. They're not downgrading anything. They're not upgrading it. They're not doing any fucking, you know, CGI bullshit. They're just, like, they're trying to present what they have. And that's, that's and, and, it's such, it's, yeah. it shows such a stark contrast between what real developers are doing. I think that's the good doing. thing about indie games. Yeah. I think when you have a small team, when you have a small team of everybody that's in the same room, in fact, yeah. when you when you have a small team with everybody with the everybody who's in the same room, the people who are making the trailer and the same and the people that are making the game, they're the same people, or they're on the same team. Obviously, all of those details are going to be right because they have all their same control. I bet when you take games like Ubisoft in consideration, I doubt the development team and the trailer team are in the same fucking state. They may I mean, not I've even seen be in the same damn country. Doors, dude, for Ubisoft, one of them's going to be in Paris. The other one's going to be in California. Like they don't fucking so. <laughs> what about on the doors, Anyways. Eshlon? Um, I I main division for a long time. So when it comes down to downgrade specifically, what happened with the original division game is they made the trailer before the game existed. Aww. They just had a completely unrelated group of people come in, make yeah. the trailer. It had nothing to do with the game because the game wasn't even real yet. And then they tried yep. to make the game so that it could match the trailer. That's it was yep, totally exactly. backwards priority. That's so stupid. Exactly. That's so dumb. See, and dude, it's kind of sad because the trailer team, they're doing their fucking job, dude. Like see, that division dude, okay, trailer so, so, was sick. So uh, I think it was a good job, but some, like some developers, that explains it. Some developers know that are working on the game ready or not. They've been trying to release a trailer for a while and like, they just keep delaying it again and again and again because they want to make sure the trailer is beyond fucking perfect. 
because they wanted to mm-hmm. represent their product well. And it just it's just so fucking mind boggling to me because what they're doing seems like okay, that's that's the re- that's how you would sell a product is you show them exactly what it is. You're honest about it, straight and forward, and like, hey, this is what we made. What do you think? And they mm-hmm. want to make sure it's presented perfectly. But mm-hmm. now you guys, because I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that trailer was CGI. I had no idea. Now it makes me think. Wait, of which same, wait, which game? Uh, the, the, the division the trailer when they showed it off at E3, right, right. and it okay, makes me yeah, think of this, yeah. the Rainbow Six Siege trailer too. The game that Siege is compared to what that trailer was, it's not even mm-hmm. the same fucking thing. It's not even in the same. Well, so here's park. here's the funny thing. I wish they would do this. I wish Ubisoft would make like a title for their trailer department because I, I guarantee you the trailer guys are killing it and every single time they're super disappointed because you I, I feel like that's right because i feel like the trailer guys like i bet they're paid to make proof of concepts like their job like they get paid to make a proof of concept so they make a proof of concept for the division they're like yo this is what we think the game should be and obviously everybody i bet i bet if you were to still talk with them and be like yeah why does the division why did the division come out and it's nothing like the trailer and they're gonna be like dude i don't know man but we <laughs> thought our shit was dope and it was like but they are not allowed to say that and here's the other thing i bet if ubisoft were to actually be transparent about who's making what we would all be on the side of the trailer people because all that like if they were like uh yeah the montreal trailer team or whatever made this we would all be like on the trailer team's twitter being like dude this is fucking dope why the hell is in the game and they'd be like i don't know but ubisoft doesn't want to tell you any of this stuff you want to know why because they're afraid that people are going to poach them because if you know who they all are you're going to know when they get laid off you're going to know who who are actually responsible for the for why the games are good and if those people get laid off or if those people start looking for another job Ubisoft is going to lose them mm-hmm. because people are going to sweep it. So they want to keep that hard to understand. They want to make it hard so you can't. All right, I'm going to stop talking because Hoonberry doesn't want me to talk anymore. <laughs> but Shut up, no, it's all good. <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel like that, uh, that, that's the secret sauce. And I think it's a little bit counterintuitive to think about it that way. But if you actually want to start looking for solutions, that's why. And it's, it's um, pretty cool. It's like, it's counterintuitive, but... Lean mentioned Anthem. It's kind of a left turn, but to tie back into that, do you guys think that they're going to add in, you know, the, the extra microtransactions or the loot boxes a la EA after it's launched? Because they've doubled down, I think, like three times now saying they're not going to do it. But do you think they will do it still? Uh, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And I, I think it honestly depends on how good the game sells. If the game sells well, they won't do it. If it doesn't sell well, they'll fucking add microtransactions. No, yeah, I think they're going to do it no matter what. It doesn't matter. No matter what, they're just going to add them after, I don't know, arbitrary amount, let's well, say I mean, three months. Yeah, it doesn't the matter. the same thing about the so, Battlefront series, too. They're like, oh, we won't do this, and then boom. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> look, they're in, they're in freak-out mode, dude. Like, let me put it this way. they There is nothing that they could hit right now. Like, I think even if... And even if you did, because you got to keep in mind, look, their objective is to make you, you guys are taking this consideration when you get to the point where you are a publicly traded company your objective is to make as much money as possible mm-hmm. not like oh hey let's make a little bit money but when we get enough we're good let's chill out like that's not how no, the mentality just, more goes and more down and more there's no limit well, yeah, they're the legally objective required is to make maximum profits. as much yeah as possible so there the, if there is any way the only reason that they would not add microtransactions is if it makes them less money. That's the only reason. If if they add in microtransactions and everybody gets pissed off and leaves and goes plays to play some competitor game, that's the only reason they're not going to play add in yeah. microtransactions. But if they have the ability to ma- add in microtransactions and it increases the long term profit margin of that game, like it Fortnite. will happen. But the thing is, a lot of like these Fortnite. games, they you have to buy the game first, and then there's microtransactions. And then there's transactions. With, with Fortnite, yeah. it's but free. that's another it's thing. Free. That's a whole other yeah. It's a whole other thing. I but... think right now. So the reason EA is – so EA is in this ridiculous position where they can't take risks, but they have to take risks. So they, they can't game. take a risk of mm. – yeah, they can't take a risk of putting in a massive budget mm. to make a free game on the off chance that the free game doesn't sell well or doesn't have a profitable microtransaction thing. Uh, but at the same time, they're running into this issue because people aren't buying full-priced games as much, especially full-priced games from EA because they're all the goddamn same. Right. So that's why EA is in this obnoxious situation where they're releasing these full price games, 
but then also having microtransactions because I think they know that that pisses people off, but they're trying to test the waters of microtransactions without exposing themselves to risk of not having a full price game. I think that eventually, in fact, here's what I think they should do. I don't know why they haven't done this yet, but Battlefield, everybody, look, I'm not saying that this is what I want. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm going to say. This is what, this is what, this isn't necessarily what I want. This is just what I think that would be the best compromise between EA making as much money as they can while also not completely pissing off the fan base. Because this is not, this is obviously controversial, but I think this is what they're going to do long term. This is what I think they're trying to figure out how to do. Um, but I think Battlefield needs to pull a War Thunder. That's what they Go need free to, to play? do. And they're, they're already experimenting with this. If you notice, they have all their launchers. So you have Battlefield 3, 4, and then 1, and now 5, all in the same thing. What they need to do is they need to have a single portal to play Battlefield. They need to release a game just called Battlefield. Battlefield. That's it. Just like War Thunder, Battlefield. And then have some kind of like long-term microtransaction base like Battlefield 5 has. Uh, in fact, I think Battlefield 5 is them continuing to experiment in this direction further to be like, okay, can we make a perpetual monetization business model that would work with free-to-play while not exposing ourselves to releasing a free-to-play game yet? But I think what would make the most sense is if they make a single brand called Battlefield that has microtransactions and then they continuously update with new theaters, new all of that, all this single experience. Yeah. So instead of be, and, and, and cool. every single the, server, dude, if they would did be that different. for Star Wars, they should do that for Star Wars, man. That'd they should be do that for awesome. everything. And they're 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 that's they're so because we're having these ideas first and we see it, but they're like an elephant. So it's hard to change direction, which is why, like, look, I'm not, I'm not defending them at all because people are going to be like, well, that doesn't make, like, it still doesn't justify them, like, having microtransactions for a full price game. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just telling you what is probably going on in their mind. They're trying to push in that direction without pissing off their investors while, by, by doing something that's so radically different that freaks out all of their investors and drops their public shares. They're trying to push in that direction as fast as they can while not un destabilizing their current, their current investment base. Mm. But that would make the most sense. Battlefield. Just Battlefield, and then every single server, and you just have all your... Just like, just like War Thunder, you got Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 5, whatever, all that stuff. In, in, in War Thunder, you can play a game with fucking biplanes and World War One-style stuff, or you can play a game with, like, jets, and now you have Modern. Should be the same thing with Battlefield. Yeah. You should be able to boot up a single game of Battlefield and have a game on one server that's in the Vietnam War and then have a game in the other server that's World War One, and then have another a game in another server that's like Modern Conflict and then have a game in the other one that's like 2142 style. Like, yeah, why the fuck not? Or you could just not? have a mix of everything, dude. It could just be... A mix of everything. And then have a single field. monetization <laughs> thing across the base. Now, a lot of people are going to get pissed. Like, I, I, see, there's some people that are saying that like it would be a great idea and I think... And I, I know there's going to be some people that be like, no, fuck that, fuck free-to-play, fuck microtransactions, I want Battlefield to just be like a single game that you buy. But the problem is, is the current climate that we're in, I don't think that's going to happen. Nobody in fact, likes I buying think those games why... anymore. Look, what look what's going on with Battlefield exactly. 2. Nobody's fucking buying it. They, like Everybody hates it because yeah. they, they go in and they play it and they're just like, oh, well, this just looks like another Battlefield game that I've seen before. Yeah, exactly. Some new maps so and the free-to-play thing is going to happen. Like I think that's the way it's going to go. And if you want to still have that, like, if you want to still have that, like, oh, I just want to buy one game without microtransactions experience, just follow smaller indie studios. Follow Black Matter. Follow, you know, like Squad. Follow, um, I don't know, what's another game? I, I have no idea. But there's games out there like that made by indie developers. So if you want to have that with no microtransactions, support the little guys. But on the big scale, that's that's what I see. That's what I see happening. And they it's might not just bad. Like stop yeah. like take a year off here and there instead of annualizing the, the whole concept like look at what ubisoft did with assassin's creed they were running assassin's creed into the ground and Every they knew it with a new yeah new so one. they they took a year off and now they're taking another year off between odyssey and whatever's and next I, I heard a lot of, i never played odyssey but i heard nothing but good things i heard it was just like really great open world fucking game i didn't get i didn't play it that's, myself but I, I heard good things about it people said it was that's another it was, thing it was a step so, in the right direction Here's here's an issue. Um, so this is actually – so I think this is really cool because if you continue looking at EA, it's really cool because it's like – they're like an octopus right now. They are, they are testing every single part of the water that they can. And that's why I was telling you before, you know, everybody was like, why even have a single-player campaign in Battlefield 1 if it's so goddamn short? And I, I was telling people, I was like, look, 
they weren't they weren't putting a single player ba- campaign in Battlefield One because like oh my gosh we need a single player player campaign. They're testing the waters of that because I think that one of the I think one of the few things that will actually be I'm sorry I think one of the few things that will actually still be sold in a more traditional way is episodic things. So like storyline driven stuff that are almost more like a TV show than like uh, a game. So like when you look at The Expanse, when you look at Game of Thrones, that kind of narrative driven stuff, people still watch that episodically and they're still open to buying that more traditionally. Um, And I think that there's video games that are pushing in that direction as well. I'm trying to think of some examples, but I can't off the top of my head. Can somebody give me an example of something that's like, like even the Fallout series. See, that's the problem. The Fallout series and the Skyrim series had that. Like, if you come out with, like, another Skyrim with with deeper narrative and story, like, I'm going to fucking... Oh, Last of Us. There you go. <laughs> Last of Us. Um, Hitman's a good one. Hitman's a really good one. Because Hitman, it's like, it's the same mechanics, but it doesn't really matter. Because in order to create a new mission with Hitman... It's a lot of work from a narrative standpoint, as opposed to Battlefield, even as opposed. This is why I'm kind of worried about games like like uh, like Squad or even like Hell Let Loose. I feel like trying to leverage game mechanics isn't going to be very viable for much longer. Um, I feel like the only way because they can be that you can't protect them. Uh, people will rip them off. If you make a bunch of games like the Battlefield series where it's just the same mechanics with new stuff, people aren't going to be as excited about that Mm -hmm. as they're going to be excited about the extension of the story, you know, or like a new episode of something. Like they want to find out what happens to people. And I see that. And I think that's why Red Dead Redemption is is also something that um or, or like Grand Theft Auto Five. I feel like that's one of the reasons Rockstar has weathered this industry crash really, really well, because their games are like very narrative focused, where a lot of people are buying it for the story that and for the depth. Of Fallout New Vegas. But, All the DLC in that game was fantastic, dude. It was just yeah. a continuation of the story that you already yes. finished. And I think they were trying to do the same thing with Kingdom Come Deliverance, too. Like, they wanted to... Because when you finished the game, it wasn't, like... There's a little I bit think there wasn't coming, enough. You know? I heard bad things about the DLC that there yeah. just wasn't enough. Well, the, the DLC... Yeah. Well, the thing is, they haven't really released any, like, awesome expansions. The DLC that they released should have already been in the first like the game to begin with to be honest and my i was actually talking Mm. about kingdom come the other day because i really think that game is really cool because it had so many like awesome traditional rpg mechanics i haven't seen in a long time and i'm just a sucker for those old school rpg mechanics i love them and had really Mm. great voice acting and it had this awesome open world but it it kind of felt like they rushed it i feel like if they would have delayed it another year and Mm. added all of that content in it would have had a much better start like one of my most pet peeves of the game and i know this is kind of irrelevant i would be fucking fighting bandits in the woods in in like they're just like there's a little campfire and they're in the middle of the fucking woods i'd shoot one of them with a bow and then i would mm. like start running up and i'd start to attack one of them would just sprint off and be like sound the alarm sound the alarm and he just fuck off yeah. in the woods and i'm like dude i'm like did they not quality test this like what is he doing yeah why is the why is this guy running trying to sound the alarm when there's nobody around there's nobody yeah and so like there there's so many like flaws when they initially released a finished game that it really turned a lot of people off and they yeah it didn't really get that attraction that they were hoping it was going to get because it had a ton of potential but uh, about i don't know it's like now probably about a year later since the game's been out i think maybe a little bit less than that the game is polished up a lot there's a big mod community for it but the game is mm-hmm. kind of dead nobody 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 plays it anymore you know what i mean and that's Dude, unfortunate here's another thing Here's what I want somebody to do, all right? This is what... Actually, you know what? I need to shut up. Sanction, I... Can you, like... Am I... I feel like somebody else needs to talk. It's not me. <laughs> hey, man. This is fine. You got, um, you got a lot of input, man. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, I don't know. I, I want to tie it back into the microtransaction and the monetization. I feel like we, we go down these wormholes and then... Of not really that's what a the... podcast is all about, man. Is the wormholes. I don't, I don't get it. other side. On podcasts. I'm and then we're, like, like out by Jupiter. We can't deviate. Well, uh, yeah, we, we just kind of go. With no, the we can flow, pivot honestly. however you want. All it is. Um, yeah, go. I want to. I want to hear you. I want to hear because I watched your video on microtransactions, and I'd like to hear you talk about that a bit. Um, I mean, I'm just like I'm against monetization in, in a full price game on principle. Um, but then you know there is a case to be made for further development, right? Like I'm not going to sit here and claim the games are free. I'm not going to try mm-hmm. and tell you like I want everything and I want it for no money. Like that doesn't work. 
Um, but it well, just feels should. like a, a slippery slope of, you know, they want their cake and they want to eat it too. They want to have their cake and eat it too. And they get a taste of that. Well, if we incentivize the, mon uh, the monetization of the microtransactions, we do a little bit more and we make more money. And then, well, we can incentivize it a little bit more. And then like, oh, well, if we, if we funnel them into buying an XP booster because it's uncomfortable to grind without the XP booster, then it's not technically pay to win, but we make more money, right? And so there's yeah. this, this creeping trend. And every time one of the industry competitors takes a step forward, all the rest of them take that step immediately after. You have a yeah. whole bunch of people trying to advance the monetization agenda. And then every time they take a step, the rest of them take that step with them. So mm. it's just, it's too many steps it's being taken It's just them trying quickly. to stay competitive and, and them freaking out. Like, that's just the FOMA stuff. Like, all of the people that run those different studios that are financial-like based and, and, and are trying to please investors, like, they're just, they're just gamblers, basically. And they just get, they just get FOMA. Like, it, it's, it's like, it's just like trying to play the stock market or trying to play cryptocurrency. So whenever a company does anything, everybody else is like, shit, should we be doing this? And then even if it's the wrong decision, if a big enough studio makes that leap, then they all... That they all do it. So, I, sorry, I'm just saying the why. I'm not trying to justify it or anything like that, but it just well, no, it makes it sense, for me. right? Like, it yeah. makes sense, and it's clearly not going to go anywhere. I mean, that's just kind yeah. of the way the industry goes. You know, fear of missing yeah. out is, is an intrinsic quality in most people uh, and most mm. corporate entities, especially. Mm. Yeah, I agree. All right, how about this? What's What's the game that you guys anticipate the most? for having proper practices like that's going to be a good game at launch it's going to have the right practices metro. i want to support uh, metro mm -hmm. i was thinking yeah, i'm going to tell cyberpunk you. i might go out on that limb i don't want to overhype it or anything but well, you know well, about uh, cd project red, yeah, CD project red like, cyberpunk's a perfect example of they like, have a great what reputation. people should be doing yeah they have a great reputation they're extremely transparent with their community they are perfectionists yeah. well, first and foremost and they're always concerned about releasing the best possible product they can and they're i can tell they're kind of sweating a bit because they're taking a risk because they made the witcher series now they're going to like a, a rpg shooter and that's totally oh different. it's totally different and that's I know the same people i think i knew that but i just never really thought about it that makes so much sense why they're so focused on narrative and and like storyline yeah, they, they, they want their game to be uh very entrancing you know like people yeah. watch game of thrones right you're like oh my god the next episode of game of thrones holy shit that's that's how they want people to feel the next time they go and play the game like oh fuck i'm gonna continue more through the story we get to unravel more bits and pieces and there's obviously going to be so many in-depth mechanics with this game because every game they've released mm. has had that standard and i would be surprised to see them drop their standard especially when it's something new um you know so i i i, I agree with you i think cd project red's going to kill it i, I think that game's going to be very popular um, I think some people might be a little upset because it might not be what they thought it was going to be, but you know, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be pretty good. I think it's going to, yeah. Gonna, gonna well, I think, well. I think the coolest thing about cyberpunk is like, it's the right, like, it's not just the studio that's making it. It's the, it's the, it's the topic. It's like the, like, that is exactly what I think is going to sell well in the future. Like narrative driven, interesting universes and worlds and original intellectual property. It's just like when I use the, um, when I use the, uh, Subnautica example, Subnautica is a very original, interesting yeah, game. Super good game. And I feel like, I feel like that is what is going to like, I feel like everybody else, everything else that survives just off of like game mechanics like battlefield where it's more about the game mechanics than it is about like the storyline or about anything like that i think those are all going to be forced into free to play in microtransaction worlds yeah. i think that's going to happen well, the thing but is, i think the... I, i'll kind of i actually kind of got a little bit of add on that as well i think it's the same thing kind of applies for matchmaking based shooters as well you know games mm -hmm. where it's just like team deathmatch or anything like just like your basic just run in the mill like matchmaking based shooters they i mean i love insurgency sandstorm i'll use that game as a game. i fucking love that game as a platform that the the fps yeah. model yeah. in that game is one of the best i've played in years i think it's so yeah. fucking good but to be yeah. honest i don't really like you know just matchmaking based yeah. shooters I mean, it doesn't really have yeah. that much substance it's it's competitive yeah. people do enjoy that for what it is but like that's kind of like i mean counter-strike was like the og game that was like that it's just like you know plant the mm. bomb team deathmatch whatever free for all but that it's like that has a lot of replayability but it's not really dynamic it's not really mm. uh it doesn't have a lot of substance like it's even like a battle royale because battle royales are mm. pretty much it's the same thing but it's it's different every single time it's a different area you have different equipment maybe there's different amount of opponents that you're fighting or whatever there's a, always these random situations that can happen which create a lot of substance and i was talking to shroud about this too the other day uh when i was gaming with him and he says yeah man like you know for me it's i either like my battle royales 
or you know a good open world like survival shooter because those games have a lot of substance like the the days where you're making games that are just like strictly just the matchmaking based shooters they they don't really tend to last that long anymore unless it's like Mm -hmm. maybe something like squad or hell Mm -hmm. let loose which is this big battlefield scope it's not necessarily just like a specific game mode like capture the objective move forward you know it's it Mm -hmm. it just has substance it has great substance yeah i think that's what people are looking for here, do you want to? I want to tell you. I, I think I know. I don't know why nobody's done this yet, but here's a microtransaction based, or not even micro, like DLC. I guess I don't know why has nobody done this. It doesn't make any sense. But like everybody here likes Skyrim, right? Yeah. It's or like game. Oblivion, yeah. or like any of those. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I don't know why. I don't know what the hell they were thinking with the new Fallout game. It was a terrible idea. Like, and I don't know mm-hmm. why they're not doing this because they would make bank. They would make bank if they did this. I don't get it. Um, but, like, here's what they should do, all right? Because I don't know how much you guys follow Skyrim, and then there's the mods for Skyrim that add in, like, new playable areas outside. I think somebody – what was it? Did they did, like, Skyrim Oh, it's, Sky, it's, it's Skywind, uh, uh, Skyrim – uh, the, the, so the Skywind Beyond Skyrim yeah, or beyond, something like this, beyond, and they, Beyond Skyrim. There's another one where they're literally like trying to create Cyrodiil, like the entire continent, yes. just but it full okay. story. But it, I, I think I know why they haven't done that is because the narrative, so, for whatever reason, in Skyrim sucked ass. Like you, every single quest line in that game was. That's true. You're just in some random situation. Well, okay. And you're now right, you're the leader of the gang screw, now. Oh, screw, oh screw, no, screw the leader Skyrim died. Then. No. Screw Skyrim. Okay, Fallout. <laughs> Fallout Four, Fallout Three, New Vegas. That had hella. That had hella yeah. narrative, right? Yeah. Very. Okay, dude. This is what. Okay, this is what I want. Okay, this is what I want. I mean, other than the fact that I want like an actual multiplayer Fallout, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, because the new Fallout is not is not multiplayer Fallout as far as I'm concerned. It's like it's like a multi it's like a Fallout theme park that you get to walk through. That's about it. Uh, but it's not actually Fallout in my opinion. But it doesn't matter if if you were gonna keep Fallout Three like single player. Here's what I would do. All right, what I would do is you would release the base game for like fifty dollars. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I get the most frustrated with with Fallout 3 or Fallout 4 is when I get to the point where I've, like, basically finished the game. Like, have you ever, like, played all through Fallout 3 and then you're, like, walking through, like, basically this... Yeah, I mean, done. now it's you're actually done. a wasteland. Yeah, when you done. first walk through it, it's like, oh my god, like every every yeah. corner has like a quest and new stuff, and yeah. then you finish everything, and you're walking through, and you're like, ah, fucking, there's nothing to yeah, do now. Exactly. This is over. What I think would make the most sense is if they release, because I, I, when I finish Fallout 3 New Vegas, or when I finish Fallout 4, like, I want to keep going, god damn yeah. it. Like, I want to keep going with my game. same fucking character. I want to leave, I want to leave this area. I want to go somewhere else. I would love to play Fallout 4 with the entirety of America. Let, 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 me, like, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something. So the idea for Escape from Tarkov, the finished product, was that mm-hmm. you start on the streets of Tarkov, and you have to complete 10, 10 raids, and you have to complete mm-hmm. story missions, side missions, as well as personal story quests. And once you escape mm-hmm. from Tarkov, like once you escape, and you finish mm-hmm. like all of the linear progression in that game, it would unlock this open world. And the open yeah. world is the end game, and where there's um, didn't they cancel that? They did supposedly. Like they <laughs> they they said something along the lines of uh, they don't know if the network or their engine structure can even support the full foundation of that, um, which makes sense because the game doesn't run that great in a lot of different instances, especially with high player counts. And I don't I don't know what their plan is for it, but that was that's the same concept that you're about to go on. But it, I wish yeah somebody I, le- would I left so hard that. I unplugged I, my headset accidentally. It would be amazing if somebody would actually do that. Think about that for Sky, so here's, for Skyrim, dude. Here's what I would like to do. I wish they would release DLC for Skyrim Fallout. I don't give a fuck. I would buy it for and and add on new sections of the map. And continue releasing that as DLC forever until they have you, you done wanna, the entirety of America. What, so, and then do the entirety of China. Then do the fucking moon for all I so, care. But people would buy that every time. A, a buddy of mine every who's working time. on the Dead Matter game that's coming out, which is going to be this new early access survival game. When it comes out, it's going to come with base building, vehicles, a functional UI and inventory system. You're going to be able to make a base. Basically all the things an open world survival game should have as a foundation. But, and they're going to do this prolonged early access period. But what they're going to do is expand their maps. Add more end game. Mm. Add basically keep mm. adding in fresh new content throughout yes. the game's development. They're gonna have like the basic fundamental features, and some of them will be kind of advanced. Like you'll be able to like repair a car, you know, manage your mm. weapons and stuff like that. Um, so there'll be a bit of depth to the base mechanics, and but they'll expand on those in the future. But they want to do this long-winded early access where there's continually 
adding on to their game, just building it, adding more extensions to the map, making new bunker assets because their end game is basically yes. seed based, randomly generated bunkers and shit. So yeah, every just time, continue yeah. expanding content, yeah, just exactly. more content. Exactly. Yeah, and see, I don't get that. I don't understand because like I feel like all of these guys that make games. In fact, this doesn't make any sense now that I think about it. You have all of these people I think Halo that make this base this, product that's amazing, and then they sell it, and then they try to monetize it with microtransactions that don't have any content. Like, if people love your game because of quality content, why? if you're going to make microtransactions, if you're going to make DLC, then why not just make more content? Like Red Dead Redemption. You don't think there's more of that world that you could explore? Like GTA 5. Like GTA 5 is a great game. I don't really care about GTA 6. I don't really care about new mechanics. Like there is I there's some of these games that you will never be able to play completely in a lifetime. Yeah. All I want is just more areas to go to. I just want more weapons. I just want I want a new goddamn map for God's yeah, sake. Yeah, new storylines. Like and how new difficult characters to me. Exactly. And and that's the thing. Like if you're going to look for something to sell, why not why not continue selling more of what people came to you to buy in the first place anyways? If you make Fallout, well then just sell more Fallout. Don't make like a different version of Fallout or like an update. Like I seriously, dude, if they were still releasing paid DLC for Fallout 3 that introduced like new zones to the map that you could seamlessly walk to. I'm not talking about like extra little quests or anything like that. I'm talking about like a new fucking like area and 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 just continue doing that forever. I would I would play it. If with GTA 5, if you started selling Red Dead Redemption, if you were to focus on selling new areas forever until the entirety of the United States is simulated, why not? Because everybody would buy that. Yeah. So 200 IQ, they got to take the hairstyles from Fallout 4 and stick them in Fallout 76 and sell them for real money. Yeah. That's that's the play. <laughs> oh man, yeah, dude. That's uh, dude. I don't know what the hell they're thinking. I don't know. I I think so. Here's the thing. You want to know why I think they're doing what they're doing? I think they lost their. Uh, I think they lost their. Yeah, Project Reality is a good good example. Project Reality is literally like it's a good base game. And they're just still adding content to it, mm -hmm. which is like exactly how everybody should do it. Like, why change something that's good? People don't care if something looks prettier or flashier anymore well, or that, anything that, like that. See, that's my worry about Anthem is I think that game is going to be very pretty, flashy, animated well, but it's going to be this very low-depth, just looty, grindy shooter. And that's it. Fallout 4 Far Harbor is not a bad example. Yeah, that's that true. was... But dude, see... Wait, that, wasn't that Fallout 3? Fallout, uh, 4. Fallout 4, I think. Uh, oh, wait, no, I'm thinking, uh, what was the last DLC for Fallout 3 is where you would go to the swamp? That was, that was my favorite DLC. That shit was awesome. Sorry, off topic. But... Swamp DLC? Now you got me curious. Yeah, I've never... It was Fallout 3, uh... Um, it was for Fallout 3, dude. I can't remember what the fuck it was called. But you go to, like, this, uh, Point Lookout. Yeah, that was it. Point Lookout, dude. That shit was good. That was a good-ass DLC. Wait, Blue Drake, you were saying something about what you thought happened with Fallout 76 and why Bethesda was doing what they're doing. I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on their motivations. Uh, oh, right. Uh, I need to let you talk more, by the way. <laughs> so no, no, it's cool. It's that. fine. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I think they lost their art team. Their art team? No, I think I they lost their art team. I think they lost everybody. Like, like full so, stop, let, they just bailed what's that, or what's got What's that pushed? other game? What's that other game that came out that's made by the New Vegas developers? You've seen it recently, Path right? No. Wait, 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 wait. Do you mean the mod wait. for wait, no, New no, Vegas? No, no, no. I meant Pillars of Eternity. Sorry. Oh, is that it? Yeah, well, Obsidian makes that, for... right? Obsidian makes the... Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, okay, honestly, so Obsidian's, of... Obsidian's they're, they're one of the best storytellers around. They, they yeah, always exactly. tell the best so... stories. Wait, Outer Pillars of Eternity. No, that's not it. No, somebody needs to figure... Outer Worlds. No, no, no. Have you seen this? Outer Worlds. Um, go look at the... Have you seen the Outer Worlds trailer? Oh, the space game, right? Oh, yeah. That's the, the one that they announced, right? Uh... So watch that, watch that video, and you'll notice it's the same dialogue style and the same narrative style as Fallout 3 New Vegas. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is, like, this because, is, this dude, is basically like they fucking... They lost everybody. That's what happened. They don't mm -hmm. have storylines and all that stuff because all those people fucking bailed. And they're probably under some NDA or something like that, and they can't talk about it. But all the people that made New Vegas so great, all the people they're that all wrote all the storylines, 
they're fucking gone, dude. They're not there. It's not yeah. like, oh my gosh, Fallout. What are you guys doing? You and everybody's sitting here. What's the what's the wait? Lead, but dude? New Vegas was what's made the... by Obsidian. Yeah, New Vegas was Obsidian, yeah. and then Fallout, Fallout Four and yeah. Fallout Three. They, yes. Basically, Bethesda gave they're them the gone, rights. Dude. They gave them the they're rights. They're not working on Fallout anymore. Yeah. They're fucking. And everybody keeps talking about what's his face. What's the big fucking face of Bethesda or whatever? Uh, Todd Howard. You think he makes that game no. all from scratch no. by himself? He He's the guy that coordinates everything and, and contracts the people to make the game. Don't get me wrong. That's an important role, and he definitely has a big influence yeah. over that. But the people that actually made the heart and soul of that game, it's not like, oh, hey, why aren't you guys working as hard as you were anymore? They're not fucking there. Yeah. They're not there anymore. <laughs> so that's that's a big part of it. So, like, Outer Worlds, dude, I'm following this. I'm following this. I'm not following new Fallout stuff. Mm -hmm. This, these are where those people went. This, if this, I, dude, I loved New Vegas. I yeah, played that same. to the end. Oh man, super good. I, the DLC the, was that's amazing one of the as well. Last, that's one of the last Bethesda games. <laughs> um, that's one of the last Bethesda games that I actually played all the way through. Same. And like these people, oh, and the mods that's, though, they're all the, the reasons mods, why. Dude, so I'm new following Vegas them. Yeah. I need to. I, Sanction, I say something. So I'm I don't still really like confused, though, because Fallout <laughs> New Vegas was made by Obsidian, which isn't Bethesda, so it, it's got almost no correlation whatsoever got, to three and four. Almost yeah, no they, correlation yeah, whatsoever. They, they basically they, they they just got the licensing to make a Fallout game. They're yeah, like, so right, if people go, left Obsidian. I don't. Yeah. I don't know why that would mean that Bethesda would publish this abomination that is Fallout 76. I, because I don't they see have the, to. Well, they just used all the shit. But they didn't lose anyone that was working. They they used all the guys who fucking worked on Fallout 4. Because all that was was just a mindless fucking... Where's no, my I bet they lost a lot of people that worked on that, too. Oh. There's no other reason why they wouldn't have any narrative. I, I guarantee you they lost... There's either a couple things that are going on. The first thing is that they lost everybody. The second thing is that all the people that would have been working on that are working on some project that hasn't been announced yet. But that they, they, they were not working on... Like, Do you think they really hired all the same number of people that made all of that depth and all of that incredible, like, complex narrative for Fallout 4? You think they hired them for the new game? Because the game doesn't have any of that. No. So what did those people do, even if you did hire them? Sitting there, like, twiddling their thumbs for the last fucking two years? They just weren't there. They're either gone yeah. or they're working on something else. I think they're probably gone. I feel like a majority of them are gone, and then there's a smaller number of them are working on something else. Uh, some other project, I actually watched a whole YouTube video about this other dude who was making this prediction as well. He thinks that Todd Howard doesn't care about Fallout anymore, and Todd Howard is actually super pumped about God knows something else. I think Starfield or whatever the hell yeah. it is, and he he used the last Fallout game as basically a way to like get money to work on his real project. Well, that would explain but why they have nobody, all the microtransactions. Even they Todd didn't realize well how much it would with. bomb. Yeah. So I don't want to put on a little tinfoil hat. It almost feels like they want to get rid of the IP. They don't care. They want as much money as fast as they can, and they wanted to put as little work in as they could. So they're like, okay, fuck it. Let's go. Let's. Sorry, I didn't mean to curse. I don't know what oh, your policies fine. are on that. Cuss away, <laughs> um, fuck shit, bitch, whatever. I don't care. All right. I've cursed on here. But before. like, they they made the game. They're like, okay, reskin it. You know, pump out some some crap here, and then and then make it pay to win eventually after they've all you know gotten over that. And who cares about the real world economy trading and the selling of caps? Like, they just don't care. So they're like, make as much money as we can and then sell the IP to somebody. Because their next big releases are Starfield and Elder yeah. Scrolls Six. Yeah. yeah. I don't see Fallout on the horizon. Like, it's just not... No, I think, yeah, think they, they kind of just ran it into the ground more than anything. They sold it. They sold a product that was just so crap. And they probably knew it was that broken. And they just did it anyway. They just they knew that they were going to sell their fucking franchise into the ground. And they were just trying to use that. Use the body of that I game think to Todd's create burnt out on that stuff. I think Maybe. what's happened they should, is... They, what with, they should have done is just give the licensing to people who are more, you know, passionate Who actually about, care. Yeah, like Obsidian. Yeah. Man, they would make... But they, they won't would. do that because they're too... Like, I, there's just... there's It's like an elephant, dude. They can't make those decisions. I think what happened is you have all the people who actually worked on the game who are burnt out. Then you have, like, either the investors or, or somebody who controls the company that don't understand any of these things. And they're like, oh, my God, Fallout. It's like a money pinata. And now you have all the people who actually made the game bailing, but you have all these investors still pouring a whole bunch more money into Fallout being like, oh, well, this is just going to continue pumping out money. Yeah, Fallout, and then you get exactly what you got, yeah, which you is just... like this shell of a game, which is yeah. obviously only corporately inspired. So, But 16 times the detail. That's what's important. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can't get over that, man. Also, they've been really quiet too. Uh, 
I haven't heard anything about Pete Hines, not that I've been looking or anything, but I really haven't heard anything from Todd Howard or Pete Hines or seen anything come out. It's just they're real silent after all of it, too. Yeah, because they, like, they don't care. Let it go. Yeah, right. They don't. They're care. They're working on something like else. Like they, to fix it. they just. Yeah, that's the problem. Like I don't think they realized this was going to be as much of a dumpster fire. Like I think they knew it was going to be bad. I don't think they knew it was going to be like, like destroy their company's reputation bad. I think they just thought that it was going to be like, like they should have just called it Fallout Online. I feel like people would have just like forgiven that more. Because like, look at Elder Scrolls Online. Elder Scrolls Online for me was like a disappointment. It was, but it was I so feel huge. like. Everybody, but you see, the funny thing is, Elder Scrolls Online still has like a thriving user base mm -hmm. because it, there's people that actually like that style of gameplay. Granted, the vast majority of them probably aren't like Elder Scrolls fans. Like they're just MMO I know fans. that th it, they're just MMO fans, and that's fine. And I think it's going to be the same thing with Fallout 76. Like Fallout 76 is like I guarantee you, there's still going to be people that play that that actually enjoy that experience, but they're not going to be Fallout fans necessarily. Yeah, they're just going to be like that kind of that kind of like they're going to. I bet the kind of people that are going to enjoy like Fallout 76 are going to be the same kind of people that enjoy like fucking Rust and stuff like that. You know, and that's not necessarily bad. Well, but not like, even Rust that because I mean Fallout 76 ha doesn't even have like a level. Isn't of even depth. as good as Rust. Yeah, it's yeah not no, even I know. Rust in, in terms of what <laughs> it can do. Like Rust, you have way more freedom in uh, availability yeah. and what you can do in the world. Hold on, I gotta yell at my dog. Incidentally, I think Rust just hit its all-time player base high. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, I think yeah, no, Rust is killing it for some reason. Yeah, they're really doing well. Yeah. Except I didn't hear good things about their last update. But because people really want a a good open-world survival game, they're just yeah. they're dying to I, sink their teeth. I, in. That's why Atlas flopped so hard. I, I personally like, feel the next Pirates? survival game that people are going to go crazy for is Dead Matter because. Uh... I just, I don't know, man. I got a good feeling about that game. Like, I got to write that down. You've mentioned that twice now, and you said some stuff that really piqued my interest. It's, it's, Dead it's Matter, gonna, you said? Yeah, it's going to be a rogue. Watch their dev blogs and watch from start to, to the, their most recent. He was on the podcast last time, right? Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, uh, he's, he actually, we actually had to tell him he couldn't be on here because, like, we we're helping him market his game and it would be a conflict of interest, but whatever. Fair enough. He's a passionate dude, man, and he uh, he's one of the developers who doesn't like to hold his tongue because usually developers are told like oh you can't say this about other people that's wrong it's unprofessional it's Ooh, bad. procedurally generated bunkers you know it's 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 really it's it's it is what it is but uh you know i, I think dead matter is really gonna set the set the bar pretty high for just open world survival games in general and i think a lot of people are gonna enjoy that um and uh another game that i've been playing a ton mordhow it's like this really awesome first person uh melee combat game that's like uh made by a bunch of shiv fans and the game is so fucking well polished, and they're gonna release mod tools, and it's all skill based combat. You can have a stick, and you can be naked, and you can be the you can beat anybody just because you're better. You know what I mean? And I want yeah. I want a combat system like that, but in a game like Rust, where it's in real a, skill based survival yeah, combat. Yeah, yeah skill that's based, rare. Skill based open world survival combat. So yeah, you could have gear that supports you and makes you better, but still, if you are the better player, and you can take that motherfucker down, like, you'll still do it. And that's another reason why I like Escape from Tarkov is because you can have a fucking Makarov and still one-click a guy who has full gear. If he doesn't have a face mask on, you can shoot him right in the face, and you can kill him, take all this shit. It's skill-based combat, but within specific situations, of course. And, uh, you know, it's just like... I have a good feeling that this year is going to be a pretty good year for games, and uh, I can't really see too many games coming out that will be doing a lot of microtransactions because of a lot of the previous flack that... Uh, you know, these bigger companies have gotten. Um, and uh, on top of that, too, it's like a lot of these games that are coming out are by these smaller studios who could not risk adding in microtransactions for fear that they would just get their games shit on all over the place. Yeah. 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 It's kind yeah, of, I think this is going to be... Since, uh, oh, go pride is a critic almost, you know, and anyone else who, who helped kind of perpetuate that as well there's such a negative stigma towards the practices that were in a lot of senses really predatory and impacted the gamer uh the the average consumer experience they're they're so scared of doing that that they're not doing it anymore like that that's a win that feels yeah. pretty good yeah and no, i hope you're right in 2019 you know continues that trend yeah i, I just i i can i can think of a, a quite a few games that i think are going to come out this year that are really just going to raise the bar for the gaming industry in general in terms of like the quality of games that you need to make in order to make sales the quality of innovation that you're going to need to make in order to actually get people interested because right now it's all about the influencers who are interested in the game and marketing the games it's not it's not commercials it's not fucking ads or billboards or anything like that it's content creators and if you're making an amazing game content creators at their foundation were gamers who want to play games and they just like games if you're making an amazing game they will play your product and they will keep playing your product and they will say good things about it because you've made a good game not because you sold it right not because you made some cringy commercial or you made commercial like whatever right 
Uh, so I, I just have a good feeling there's going to be quite a few games coming out this year from smaller companies that are going to overshadow these bigger guys. And uh, Yeah, I think go ahead. this is going to be a year where people figure out how to do it right. Yeah. I think that's what it's going to be. Um, so I agree as well. Like I think it's going to be a good year for gaming because with the crash that's happening and with everybody, yeah. like n- not only can people not make mistakes like they used to, well, I'll tell you, but I'll, I think at the same time, mm-hmm. right now, everybody, every creator I know from the top to the bottom, they're all looking for a main game. Now they're all looking for something else. Like all of these AAA titles have come out. They only play them for their sponsored streams and they never pick them up again. You know, they are yeah. looking for a main game to play. They're looking for something to enjoy, but there's not, quite anything out there right now besides the few handful of early access games that are the only innovative things that we're playing but they're in early access they're not finished yet and they're still lacking content polish and uh features so mm. you know i i i just i just think there's a uh this is going to be an interesting year for games i think there's gonna be a lot of new things that are going to be coming out that will really make people understand like oh this is what a good game's about this this is what a passion project's about you know what I mean? Um, so. On the scale of indie to triple A, where is Dead Matter? I, I don't uh, know much about it. Indie, indie, indie. They have like three developers. Indie, they, have, they have oh, one, very they have one programmer. They have one animator and one asset creator. And they, they, they're looking for more team members as well. They're looking to bolster the team a bit. Um, and uh, it's it's honestly, that game is going to be fucking tight, dude. It's It already has a lot of things functioning. And right now, a lot of what they're working on is just really their world, just building their map. Even the map itself is supposed to be randomly generated. Like, it's the same map, but the location of stores, bunkers, uh, different facilities, hotels, and buildings like that, all randomly generated. It's like every, cool. every, every server that you go into will have the same buildings and shit, but they will be in a different spot. And it takes from like roguelike gameplay, because I love roguelike games, and there's not many of them out anymore. You know, where there's real, like, if you die, you're going to face some consequences of some kind. Um, and that kind of mm. adds that edge. It's kind of like Rust. You die, you lose all your shit. Like, Daisy, yeah. you die, you lose all your shit. Tarkov, you die, you lose all your shit. That's, that's exciting. And that's what it kind of fuels uh, people to kind of keep playing. And that's why games that are like, like I was saying, like Sandstorm, a fucking amazing shooter, but it kind of just lacks substance because it's just your run in the mill objective game modes. Even though yeah. the objectives are fun, yeah. they're competitive and they're they're well made. Like I love they're the f- doing really yeah. well. They are they're doing, doing a lot great. better doing, than I thought they were doing, going to. They're doing super based well based off of yeah just they're, selling a game mode. Yeah, they're going. No, that's good. Yeah, they're doing super fucking well. And I'm happy because their game. So I like I like to compare Scum and Sandstorm pretty well. So Scum had this fucking goddamn cannon of a hype ball that came out right when it first released, but it lacked substance. It was just this empty open world with zombies, mechs, and other players. There's no base building. There's no vehicles. There really wasn't a lot of shit to do. Sandstorm was kind of the opposite. It had like no hype, but it steadily just kept growing and growing on its own because it's a quality product made from passion. And it's totally different than anything else on the market. That's a lot of the reviews I've seen. Wow, this shooter just, it's not like any other shooter I've played. It's totally different. It's a great FPS model and it's fun. But for me, just like for the games that I like, I don't like matchmaking based games. They eventually just get redundant and, you know, boring to me, even if it's a competitive kind of thing. Like uh, the, the, for competitive games, I don't know. I, I kind of need some kind of, uh, it ha- there needs to be some kind of edge of some kind. I don't really know how to describe it. I've never really been a big competitive gamer, but, you know, I feel like that's not like a mass appeal for a lot of people. You know, then there's Counter Strike and Overwatch. You know, a lot of people try and go, ca- uh, you know, competitive in that because there's a big competitive scene for it already. You know what I mean? And people want to try and get into that breakthrough and, you know, become a competitive gamer, gamer and maybe, like, win a tournament or something to get paid. Um, mm. But, yeah, no, you know, it's just, like, there's, like, these good games are releasing and, like, they're they're generating uh, their communities and growing at just, like, a, a steady rate, which is really cool to see, especially from these smaller companies because, you know, uh, the New World Developers, that was their first game that they released. They've never made a game. but Like, they made the mod, Insurgency for Source, but this is their first ever standalone game and, I, I can't wait to see what they do next. I know they want to do more, and there's plans after Insurgency Sandstorm with some new IPs, so I can't wait to see what they do. Yeah, it seems like the uh, the hardcore games, the ones that you talked about with, you know, a real kind of pang in your heart when you lose, and you lose all your gear, and you lose progression and stuff, they're getting, at least in my experience, uh, a little bit more rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of games are now going for the cartoon graphics. They yep. take the hue saturation slider, and they're like, oh, wing, let's throw that off the <laughs> screen and make everything super colorful. And then they're really targeting a, a younger, more casual audience. Um, I know that there's still hardcore games out there, but you know these these indie companies that are producing more, you know, hardcore oriented, especially in the survival landscape. Uh, that is that is something to to keep track of. I think absolutely. I mean, for those that are that are interested, of course, some people may not be into that style of game, but right. Well, I mean, it definitely looks like it could have a future in in 2019. 
I mean, as we trend away from the AAA stuff. I also feel gamers like nowadays, like there, we're, a lot of us are growing up. You know, we're kind of growing up with technology at the same time, and a lot of us are looking for experiences that are something that require a bit of thought process. You know, it's not just something like here, R reload, shoot, right click, aim, switch to weapon, shoot bigger gun. You know, we, we're looking like even just maybe I'm speaking for myself here, but looking for something that actually requires a bit of depth and thought. You know, requires the player to mentally invest himself into the game instead of just well, I'm hopping on the game to play the game now. You know, just a, just like a casual gaming session. Not saying that's wrong, but I think that's why a lot of these games are selling is because people don't really have that mindset anymore. They're not trying to sit down and, you know, just, oh, I'm going to just game and frag out for a little bit. No, they're wanting to invest their time into an amazing experience that they can really get sucked into and maybe even lose themselves into because games help a lot of people escape a lot of different kinds of problems in their life. You know what I mean? Like all of us kind of, Absolutely. you know, we want to play a game so that we can kind of like, uh, experience another kind of story that maybe we couldn't experience IRL. Like we can't just fucking, you know, go and just go run around in the woods and shoot people and loot them and fucking go about and do that and then just respawn. It doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. Um, yeah. It feels like gaming's kind of become a series of pendulums. You have one that swings out towards the casual end and then maybe back towards the hardcore. You have one with monetization, mm -hmm. you know, that one's still swinging out towards yeah. the, how much money can we earn in what different mechanisms and how quickly right. um, there's one for everything, right? You could even go political with it and say that there's one swinging left or right um, with different agendas that are, that are seeping into it. So, I mean, pendulums do what pendulums do. They're going to go way out before they come back. And I think 2019 might be the year that we see it come back to a more reasonable middle ground. Right. Because right now it's, well, look it's at out Sandstorm. on the side. Sandstorm is a perfect example of that because it's right in the middle. It has tactical, um, you know, it has a very tactical, well thought out player controller that allows you to like retain your magazines, yeah. interrupt reloads. Uh, the yeah. guns are lethal. It, you know, the guns have a recoil. You know, insurgency is a case study yeah. of ideal player yeah, controller. It, it's like it's like right. It's, it's like right in the. It's, it's perfect. Right, it's perfect in the middle. But it, yeah. it's it's a it's it's like it's not some super deeply complex game. However, it has very in depth mechanics. And also has just a ca they have casual game modes that you can play just like rush yeah conquest or push i think or it has the most in-depth mechanics while also retaining that accessibility yeah. and i think that's really i think that's the cool thing i think that's what i underestimated about insurgency it's like it's the same thing it, it's very similar to to the previous game but it's the only game that does what it does so well in the unreal engine 4 engine right now and even though it seems it seems like that stuff is kind of straightforward to do like there's so many things where you're like why doesn't everybody do it this way or why doesn't everybody do it this way mm -hmm. and yet they still don't i kind of i have neglected to realize that there isn't a there wasn't a game like sandstorm that was actually out like there's no, a there lot was, of there games no, out there there's literally no game like it at all. Even though Nothing. it's like it's the it's the the perfect it's like it's ex it's like almost no brainer. It's like well of course like this is all the best game design and for for a first person shooter player controller that every like everyone should be using yeah, that. And I feel like that's why I'm happy Sandstorm exists because now when everybody's like well because it's really funny frustrating when you play a game and you're like yeah I don't really like how this feels and they're like well how do you think you should feel and you want to look at it and be like well just do it the way that you know you should do it. Now you can just be like look at Sandstorm like. This is look like this is how this is how it is. This is how it yeah. should be. So Siege is pretty good. I like Siege. But... Yeah, I, I could never get into that's Siege was, myself, yeah. but that's uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely it's just like the leany Counter Strike in my opinion. Now what we need to have is just open source insurgency sandstorm. <laughs> See that that's what I'm hoping they do. And I know oh, I was I was talking I was talking to the uh, developers for it, and they were kind of on the fence about exactly how, what their modding would be and they, they talked about possibly character model switch maps and you know gun skins yeah. and i was like mm. i was kind of worried i'm like is that it or yeah or are we going to be able to make like yeah. our own game modes out of this because i always go back yeah. and I look at daisy daisy like in my opinion pioneered a majority <sighs> of this shit oh, arma 2 mod know, daisy unfortunately Definitely. That's the unfortunate thing about Sandstorm, because look at, like, so Sandstorm and Insurgency is starting to get to the point where they're succeeding so much that they're going to start running into a lot of the same issues that I think I've seen other people. Like, like I said, look at the people who work there. Look at the kinds of, like, relationships that they're in. Sandstorm, who's it published by? Tripwire. What? <laughs> Tripwire? No, uh, it's, uh, let's see, hold well, up. Uh, in, it's... in, in... Focus Interactive, yeah, not Tripwire. Focus Interactive, yeah, focus there on. you go. Yeah, that's going to affect that. That's going to affect the mod support. And as much as I love NWI, and as much as I love the spirit, and I guarantee you that spirit's going to be there, but it's now going to be under focus. 
And I feel like there's going to be a lot of things that they're going to want to do, that we're going to want them to do, mm-hmm. that they might get stonewalled from doing. And part of what I'm expecting that could be is the mod support. It may not end up being as open as Source was, because I don't think Focus is going to think that that actually lends to it being as profitable as it could be. Well, hey. And Insurgency is now reaching that tier where they're going to start entering that corporate world. Well, the thing is, where... m- more people bought Arma 2 to play Daisy Mod than they did to play Arma 2. And if, 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 if publishers can't understand that, that if you can literally have communities create a new game out of your game, you have to pay, you pay nothing. And they, mm. they will buy your game just so they can play another experience. Just doesn't matter if they're not playing your game. You're still getting your money, and you're still supporting gamers and people who are passionate about these different experiences. And yeah, it, yeah the it, modding community really can can carry a game to the next look level. Look at Skyrim, I, dude. It lasts. Yeah, for I've 10 never understood years. why developers don't they, give they hate control it. over hate it. to the modding community. They want to community. destroy it. They want to destroy it. They hate it. And I think that. I think that's a the mistake. Like what they should really be doing is weaponizing their modding community, but I think they can't figure out how to do that either. Well, just don't um, do the creation club or yeah, that yeah, type no, of thing. No, don't do that, that. I think what would make the most sense, and I don't know why they. This is what I was saying. Like I seriously think what would made would have would have made the most sense is they should just like they should do what because e, EA did this for a while too. Um, like here, let me just say this: every single time a game has been made. That is similar. Like every single time that a modding team for a studio goes on and makes a game that competes with the the game that they made a mod for, that is that studio failing to weaponize their community. Absolutely. Because I feel like like you can instead of instead of just being like, oh, but we don't want to promote people competing with us, like it's like, dude, go to them. Be like, hey, look. Join our team. You don't even have to do it as the creation club. Like, pay them a goddamn salary and make them a part of the actual experience. You know, like that. That's what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on taking those people and incorporating them, not into like this paid DLC thing that's like the creation club. Like, make them a part of Bethesda. Mm-hmm. Like, make them, and you can build out your company, and you can have like, look at the way you. I mean, hell, YouTube has taken this to an extreme where they just let anybody. And even Twitch is the same thing. Being a Twitch partner, like, they should have somebody they should have a system where they can weaponize these people in a way that's not like microtransactions but it's actually a part of ex- of expanding the core part of the game dude like see what i would do is the guys that made bruma i would go to the guys that made that whole bruma mod for skyrim which adds a whole like other area mm-hmm. i would go to them and be like hey look dudes we're going to pay you a quarter million dollars and we're going to buy out your mod and then we're going to bring in all all our guys in we're gonna take all your assets. We're gonna bring them up to AAA. Mm-hmm. Then we're gonna and, and we're and then we're gonna release your mod as a paid DLC Expand- for the entire no, game. Well, and it wouldn't just- even be DLC. That's an expansion. See, that's that. No, exactly. Remember the that's controversy. The point. It's not back- even yeah. DLC anymore. Yeah, it's it's not expansion. like tiny little tidbits. No. And then keep doing that until you've recreated the entirety of the planet of Zero. Elder Scrolls. Yeah. Like, why not? That's yeah. what people want. Wait, but want. when? When do you do that? When do you enact that process of kind of absorbing those assets and then publishing that DLC? It's because if you ongoing. do it after people have already played it, then you're taking away Dude, something. Honestly, so I, I have a lot of disagreements of of how it was handled. Um, but when you look at Squad and you look at at Postscriptum, that is actually uh, – th- there's, there's a lot of uh, ways that you can improve the transparency of that process. And you can improve – because there, that's another concept. That's another topic entirely. But when you actually take into consideration like the logistics of weaponizing your modding team, um, OWI is actually a pretty good example mm-hmm. of that. Uh, 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 there, there's obviously other concerns that I've had in terms of like transparency and other things, and that that'll be a topic for another mm-hmm. time. But 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 in terms of actually absorbing, weaponizing, and utilizing your community to actually create products, that's a good example. And I feel like if you were to do, you could take that exact same practice, and you can employ that in so many other places. Um, you could you could go to when when you look at Skyrim. When you look at Fallout, when you look at all of these people that are creating all of this content, when you look at UE4 as well, like UE4 really is 
Um, it really is a really powerful tool set that is now becoming more accessible. You have more 3D artists now than you've ever had before. You have more 2D artists. You have more animators. You even have more programmers than you've ever had before. There's there's a lot of people graduating from game development yeah. uh, universities every every day more than in, in, in than ever. Yeah. And the tools are getting better. Well, it's because we have Which the tools means... now. Before, you know, like if you wanted to use this dice engine, you had to pay probably, I don't know, 500K. <laughs> Minimum. And that's a that's a natural resource. Mm -hmm. That's a natural resource that I feel like could be tapped into for all games more responsibly for all games. I mean, uh, so the game I was telling you about Mordhau, which has this very awesome first person, you know, co like combat. That's a, it's it's still you know it's it's probably I want to say it's like eighty percent finished, but for the most part, the core elements of the combat are there, and they're gonna do big open source mod. They're huge on that. They want to open source their entire game. And like, I really hope that somebody would step in and make this open world experience with that kind of combat, but in like a rush like environment with like base building castles, towns and trader markets and shit. It'd be fucking awesome. And you could even add goblins yeah. and like monsters. Mm -hmm. you, it doesn't even have to be people anymore. You could literally create a fantasy world if you wanted to. And, uh, you know, that that's all from just making your shit open source, allowing communities to step in and create free content that will make your game live for much longer than your fucking shitty microtransactions would for Red Dead Redemption. See, there is a tipping point, though. I actually think that, and this is this is actually goes back. So we were talking about studios. So I'm actually going to play devil's advocate with myself mm. um, and <laughs> say that there's another side of this entire aspect. Um, so we were talking about how there's studios that, are weaponizing their modding communities in order to create products. Right. And somebody does say here, uh, the guy, uh, I'm assuming he's referring to me, guy is over simple not find it, timeline is off, once modders make it free for people who have already played it. Um, that, that's true. There, there's, there's a whole other topic about that in terms of like transparency, how you onboard, not obviously re-releasing the exact same thing that, that was announced to be for free or something like that. that that's a whole separate conversation of, 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 of of business practice that could obviously be um, improved, but there's there's a, there's another whole aspect of this as well. Um, when you when you look at studios that are taking modders and are creating uh, paid content, um, there's a whole another aspect of this, which is, and this is it, I I because I, I, I know people think that I talk about this a lot, and I don't want to sound like I'm tying this into this because. This is this is an entirely separate conversation, and this is an entirely separate path that the industry could take. And I think that this is like a 50-50 chance. I feel like it could go this direction, and if it goes this direction, it, it fucks everything. Like, it just completely decimates everything. The crash that we're in, it's going to get worse, uh, depending on who you talk to. I guess in some cases, worse is better. Uh, in fact, for me, worse <laughs> is better. If this happened, this would benefit me substantially. Um, but here's another thing. I want you to take a look at this. Uh, here's a group, the Godot engine. Um, just post that there. Uh, take a look at that. Where do you post that? That's the Godot engine. Oh. And this is a game engine that is being made... Uh, Based off of pay, oh my god, they made three thousand dollars a month. Oh, that's hilarious because of the Unity thing. I just, I just backed them yesterday as well for ten dollars nice. a month. Oh my god, they're killing it. Okay, this is a game engine. Go look at this. Go look at the screenshots of all this stuff. Yeah, I guess like 2D, this is an 3D. alternative to Unity. This is being built as an alternative to Unity. And have have you guys seen all of this stuff about Unity recently? No, uh, yeah, about they, how Unity they, is changing they, they, their they, terms they, of service they, yeah, in order to undermine yeah, they, uh, third party developers. I was gonna say they they, uh, uh, they changed like some it, framework, it, right? I mean, it, it, tracks, it, it fucked I, up a lot of people's like, yeah, games. yeah, yeah. So so basically, and this is something that I've been afraid of, and this is a big conversation. I have there has been a lot more examples of this over the years that I have not talked about that are both immoral and, and massive things that I disagree with incredibly strongly. And this, is, this has happened before. Um, but what Unity did is they changed their terms of service to make a uh, third-party product under Unity, specifically Spatial OS, uh, no longer... Uh, well, I, I guess I, it, they made it so it's illegal for Spatial OS to operate. Um, and they actually changed that. In fact, there was just an update released to this. Unity uh, allegedly confirmed with Spatial OS that they were in compliance with the terms of service until Unity specifically changed it December 5th. Um, and now Spatial OS has been made illegal to use with Unity. And a lot of the reasons that people are saying that they're, uh, the, one of the biggest suspicions that I and a lot of other people have is Unity has recently raised um, a, a significant amount of funding to create 
uh, essentially a direct competitor to Spatial OS, um, but in-house. And they have now changed their terms of service to undermine one of their, their biggest main competitors within their own community. Um, and that practice is massively immoral massively immoral and i have seen this practice happen before there has been a lot of times that this has happened that i have not talked about publicly because it's a very complicated thing that has absolutely destroyed my relationship with with uh with 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 other studios and companies um and and uh this is this is a massive problem ongoing this is a massive problem with games this is a massive problem with engines this is a massive problem with game creation tools there are games out there so for instance you saw battle state um, Battle State. Uh, 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 I don't know if they ever proved this in court. I don't think they would because I don't think it would work. Um, but they said that in their terms of service, they own all content. Yeah. Uh, use exactly. And th there is a massive problem where people are using their games not as a game, but as bait, uh, or using their engines or their tools not as an engine or a tool, but as bait right. in order to get people to agree to these things that completely compromise their ability to operate as a business. This has been a massive ongoing problem for years that I have been incredibly adverse to, ag aggressively, aggressively adverse to. Um, and one of the, one of the, the, so take that entire situation. That's a massive problem. One of the solutions to this problem is the Godot engine. The Godot engine and what it is is an alternative to Unity that is being made purely off of the support of the public. Right now they have a That's Patreon funny. where they're making $12,000 a month to develop this engine, and the entirety of the engine is released under the MIT license, which is an irrevocable license that allows anyone to use it for any purpose forever. And there is no ability to change the terms of service. There is no ability to change the license agreement. There is no ability to change anything. Wow. And that is huge. And there is a lot of uh, – and I feel like the Godot engine is a great example that draws attention to this problem because there's a lot of times in the past couple of years that I've tried to explain this to people. And they're like, well, why don't you support these people? Why don't you support this? And it's like you don't understand. If I were to support those people, they have implemented systems that undermine me fundamentally, and they know that they're doing it. And we have, we have been – aggressively adverse to anything even remotely resembling that. Um, and I think a lot of the t for, for a long time, people were like, ah, but who cares? You know, whatever, it doesn't matter. And people say that until something massive happens, mm -hmm. until Battle State starts trying to DMCA you, yeah. until Unity starts trying to undermine you by changing the terms of service, until somebody tries to destroy you using this leverage that they've been building over time and telling you not to worry about. And and the Godot engine and MIT licensed software and open source software is the solution to this. If this happens, however, if this happens, and if and if the Godot engine and all of these open source tools and engines become completely free, this completely undermines anyone being able to take their modding community and incorporate their product because it's going to get to the point where it's going to be so it's going to be so viable to create a competitor to Skyrim or so viable mm. to create like so these modding com com there, there's going to be absolutely no reason to work for the people that you're creating mods for um, and I also think that this is one of the reasons that a lot of these studios that are trying to weaponize this business practice of incorporating their modding teams are starting to get considerably more aggressive at trying to get these people to agree to long-term contracts and long-term agreements and lock down as many people as they can in this very limited time frame before this all comes crumbling down and it is impossible to do it ever again. If that happens it once again changes the industry from a very low level completely again. So, Godot Engine, go check it out. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, that sounds, that I love this that stuff. Sounds great. It's great. Pisses no, a whole bunch of people off. No, but it's well, great. yeah, well, it's because a lot of the people who have been making these games for the longest time, they were the ones who were developing the engines. There was no one else who had engines. You know, like, we mm -hmm. make the engines. We make the games. Yeah. You know, yeah. we also promote the games. And now it's no longer like that. The creators are promoting promoting the games. The yes. communities are, are funding games. Like uh, yes. you got Kickstarter, you got Indiegogo, all of that kind of yes. stuff. Like these, the, the people are looking for experiences now that are no longer delivered by these, these titans in the industry anymore. And yep. it's showing because their fucking stocks are crashing hard as fuck because it's nobody, going to get 
worse. It's gonna be worse. Or Nobody's better. buying their games. The only the only better for us, worse for them. Yeah, the only way it's gonna get better, at least for them, is if they just do a one hundred and ten like a fucking one eighty entirely and change up. But their they business. can't do that. It's no. impossible. No, the no the investors, the their board members, like they're too old and they're too out of touch with this to even understand that this is what's happening. So by the time they actually realize this, it's gonna be over. And a lot of these people don't really care. Um, because a lot of these investors have protection, so basically they can milk this for as long as it's milkable, and then when it all crashes, it doesn't really matter because they just go on to investing onto the next thing. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just, it's just like cryptocurrency. It's like being a whale. Like it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if Litecoin or Bitcoin crashes or not. There's going to be people making money both ways. You know, like yeah. there's and, and, if, and the smart investors like they don't care. They're going to try to pump this up as high as it can go. And then they're going to as soon as it's ready to crash, they get a strategy for that, too. It's not really good for the consumers, but it's good for them. Yeah. So well, it's hard to, like, convince pro- people to not really do this prof- stuff. Because... They'll profit no matter what they're going to gain yeah. no matter what. Like for them, it's it's not a lose lose. It's a win win situation. And they just don't really care. They're just like, well, can we is... talk more about spatial OS? What, what about spatial OS law? I don't know why people are asking about this. I don't know either. Um, what Sorry, do you guys interrupt. think about Activision dumping Bungie, or um, I guess Bungie splitting from Activision? Do you think Dude, that was like a, a an actual long term, you know, I think it's a good, yes. cost I think it's a good call. That's I, I a... think Bungie should be much more independent. I mean, having a big person like Activision over your shoulder who's basically controlling everything that you're going to do is bad. Look what it was going to have with Halo Infinite. I, I guarantee you, Halo Infinite's going to be that game that you were talking about, Blue Drake, that. They want to make this game, and they want to continually expand it over time. They're, it's going to basically going to be the Halo Warframe or Halo Path of Exile. They're just going to keep adding on to it, and that's what I think they're about to do. And that's probably one of the reasons why they split from Activision is so they can have the freedom to keep expanding their game without having to be, you know, uh, being told like, oh, well, you have to sell it. You can't just make it. Yeah. And I feel like the the people yeah. who made the Halo franchise, they were very pa- the Halo franchise was awesome, dude. Like Halo One, Two, Halo Three, in my opinion, was the best. Oh, did Halo. you see um Installation One? Is that where uh, the movie? Or no, the um the game. The game. You mean ODST or? Nope, Installation No One. Go no, look it up. No, uh, I'll have to check it's it out. It's the uh, it's the fan made complete oh, recreation. Oh yeah, and you can't of... stream it or you get DMCA. Yeah, that's fucking yeah. I yeah. I... No 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 no. That's a different one. Hold up. See see this that was is the mod for Halo. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I maybe I made cool that one. So, it to me. So. Let me tell you how this works, because this is, again, like these are the kinds of minefields that I love to navigate. Microsoft has this interesting license agreement for Halo where if you make – you are allowed to remake anything in the Halo engine uh, or in the Halo franchise mm-hmm. and, and release it, but you can't make any money off of it, and it has to be entirely your own work. So, for instance, the one that you would get DMCA'd for playing, basically what happened is those guys, I think, figured out how to export. Yeah, yeah. So the Dorito one, they figured out how to export a bunch of assets, I think, from like Halo 3 from the Xbox or something like that. So Dorito was literally using assets that were made by Microsoft. Yeah. But there was another project called Installation 01, where it was basically a bunch of kids like six years ago that got together and they started on this project where they they recognized this license agreement that Microsoft allowed and they set out to remake the entirety of the original like Halo but from scratch and for free. <laughs> That's cool. And they just released the announcement trailer for it. I think I saw um, it. It looks it looks like a spit it's basically a spitting image of Halo three. Yeah, exactly. And it's made by fans and they, they, they checked all the boxes for what they're allowed to do and they did like an entire game dev production for Halo, but for free and with no commercial gain. And now it's finally after like six years about to release. That's awesome. Cool. I do, I'll pop That's that. really cool. Big big so, props to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that. And I think that, that when when we when we look at this, um and, and when you look at Activision and Bungie and stuff like that, that again, that's exactly the kind of stuff. Like if you want to figure out what the next Halo game's gonna be like, if you wanna figure out whatever that, like follow that kind of stuff. Um, follow like what Activision is doing, follow what uh Bungie is doing, follow what the people that are uh working with Activision, working with Bungie are thinking. What I mean when you look at this stuff like with Unity and Spatial OS, like this massive scuffle is going <laughs> to affect I love that word. I've never dude. heard it before. I've never heard that Use before. Use it, dude. I'm fucking I'm coining that right Still, now. Yeah, I'm stealing um, that Yeah, but uh but th- that is going to fundamentally affect game development. Like it's going to fundamentally affect the kinds of products we're gonna see. And if you want to start figuring out like if you want to both figure out and also influence 
these agendas that you guys have or these opinions that you guys have about microtransactions and all of this stuff. Figure out those kinds of situations. Figure out those people that agree with you that are on these teams. Figure out the people that disagree with you who are on these teams. Watch where they go. Support what they do. You know, fig- or, or don't support what they do. <laughs> but that's what's going to make these things happen. It's the people. It's not the products. It's not the team. It's not even, it's not even the names of the, 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 the studios or anything like that. You like Activision. You think it's the same people in Activision that were when are on it now than the people who made like Call of Duty 2? No, fuck no. You know, and that that's... Go ahead. Sorry, I'm talking too much again. Okay, I'm getting like. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I was listening. One one thing I did want to talk about because I I do have to go pretty soon, but I I wanted to you know bounce around in this chat room specifically is is the topic of Division Two coming out on the Epic Games Launcher as opposed to yeah that you know I yeah the fucking people seem to want their own platforms now, especially Epic, you know especially with what happened with Fortnite they want everything to be channeled and. At the same time, uh, with the Epic Game Store, uh, developers are actually getting a better payout than they would with Steam from there. Um, yeah, Epic has a lot of a lot of benefits, right? And then you see the dark side of that, where Bethesda comes out with the Bethesda launcher, and that's uh, uh, the worst possible version, right? So, but it, to me, it was just a really odd choice to have Division Two move over to a platform which is obviously going to be populated primarily with Fortnite's audience initially. That's the best, you know. They're already fans of Epic Games and be a young audience can be very young children that aren't even really eligible in most cases to play division two so they're going over there for an increased revenue cut right they're up what they get an extra 18 percent from 30 to 12 percent so are they going to actually make that back is it even worth it for them so i don't know it just it plays back into this kind of monopolizing Sorry. control game isn't really beneficial for, absolutely for average consumers absolutely i mean it's just it almost seems like there needs to be like a universal platform and that's what always that's what steam's been for the longest time steam has always been the platform where all the games are sold and that's what everybody's used to having and whenever there's ever a time where people are like oh this game's not on steam this is bullshit i hate it because it's not on steam you know they they, they tend to get pretty upset about that um but what they don't really realize is that you know developers themselves could be actually gaining more um if they sold say on the epic games launcher you know what i mean i'm curious to see how that does um, cause I mean, I, I have the Epic games launcher and I, I think it's a pretty clean look, no pun intended. It's a pretty good looking platform. You know, it looks, looks nice. It's navigated. You can navigate it pretty easily. There's no like bullshit DRM in there that, you know, slows your game down or does any of that kind of fucking bullshit. I mean, I can still trigger my shit through steam if I wanted to, you know, I could play uh, any of the games on the Epic game store with my steam controller just by going through steam, add non steam game, adding it. Boom. I have all the features through steam that I would like while still being able to play the game. Um, so. Yeah, no, I think it can be done properly with an independent launcher as well. I mean, Epic is definitely an alternative to Steam, which is good. You don't really want to have a monopoly in the industry. Sure. Um, but like you said, influencers and, you know, guerrilla marketing in some capacity is starting to take over as the primary form of getting the word out. So you can have an indie game that doesn't have a high marketing budget in the millions, like Destiny 2 did, for example, but it can gain <sighs> nearly as much traction just through word of mouth. Sure. So they can do it in the right way where they launch on their own launcher and they, they have all their the revenue to themselves, um, but then people market it for them. So it's just an, it's an interesting call to me to have Division 2 be put on the Epic Game Store instead of just Uplay um, or or Steam in general. And uh, I don't know. It was, I, I have a feeling uh, they know that and they're just trying to test the waters. They want to see if uh, it's the product that will bring somebody over. Because at the end of the day, if the Division 2 is a fucking stellar game, and it's very good. It's gonna bring a lot of people to their platform, and I think. What I feel the... like every game is eventually gonna have its own launcher. Yeah, I mean, I I think that'd be think fine. I mean, I'd, I'd prefer it if it would just be the game has the launcher instead of you know, uh, having a platform that then launches the game. Uh, yeah, because it... it's gonna get to this point where like, like look at Bethesda's launcher. There's like what, like four games on there. Like at at what point does it stop making sense? You yeah. know, like it's like oh now we got a launcher for two games. Or like a launcher for four. Like it's mm-hmm. just, just make it launcher for every single yeah. game. You yeah. know, like it's, it's like Origin, Bethesda launcher, yeah. like, you play. Look at how War yeah. Thunder does it. Look at how PR does it. Look at how like World of Tanks does it. Like everybody should just do that. Like they shouldn't be <laughs> trying to make like it, it's not going to be viable to make like a whole platform anymore. It, it's going to un- undermine consumer choice as well. And I think they know that, but it's not going to fly. Every game should just have its own launcher. Like. 
like that just makes the most sense it's easy to it's it's easy compared to many years ago to set up like infrastructure in order to support that per game now like mm-hmm. it's not that big of a pain in order to set up the same kind of stuff that steam does like it's not that hard like look project reality does it if a free goddamn mod can have their content launcher then yeah. you know <laughs> you can too so like it's 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 going to be something that i think that's where everything's going to head because not very many people you're going to have stuff like discord and you're going to have in fact it's funny it's almost going to like regress it's almost going to like regress to where it was like 10 years ago where you had all your own games you install them individually and then you had stuff like TeamSpeak. I think eventually you're going to have all your own games you install them individually and then you're going to have stuff like Discord or God knows what the hell yeah. else. Um, but it's not going to be just like everything on one giant monopoly of a platform anymore, <laughs> which is good. It's exactly. They all want See, that though. That's no, the do. funny Discord part. Discord has its yeah. store, yeah. but like I don't think it's going to work out that well. No, like, I think it's a good idea. But I don't think Discord store Discord store I think is going to end up being like an afterthought. Like the, the, I o- think... the only the only way that these these platforms would be able to, at least in my opinion, get a lot of people to start using them is if they created titles or products that would attract people to those platforms. And I think that's what they're trying yeah. to do with like the, the division. Yeah. Assuming the make the, it the, like division, exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Assuming the division is a great game. It's no different than consoles. There's PS4 exclusives. Yeah. There's Xbox exclusives. Well, guess what? We're going to have Epic Game Store exclusives. Steam Store exclu- You think Steam is going to sell their shit anywhere else but Steam? Or Valve, I mean? Mm-hmm. Fuck no, they won't. Whenever yeah. they release uh, yeah. Left 4 Dead 3 and fucking Half-Life 2 with the new Source 2 engine, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you bet your ass it's not going to be anywhere else but their store. And I don't mm-hmm. blame them. Who would? It's it's their shit. They want to sell it on their own turf where they've already grown mm-hmm. their own community. Um, yeah. And so a lot of these other up and comers trying to come up and, you know, when it's these new, you know, when I remember when Origin came out, oh my God, did people fucking hate Origin? Same thing with you played. <laughs> fucking everybody hated yeah. it because one, it wasn't Steam and two, it also. <laughs> Why do you keep saying that in the past tense? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but it's just, you know, it's People just they, they the the launches themselves were shitty. But then I look at the Epic Games Store here, and I'm just like, this is actually isn't that bad. They actually got a lot of indie games here from a lot of different people yeah. who are just sponsored and or published by Epic Games, and they're just trying to create their own products there, and, you know, they're getting a good cut. So, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, man. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, the Epic Games launchers made some positive steps. As far as I can tell, I just reread their, uh, their refund policy. Uh, updated to a better version for consumers. Um, See, I think Epic Games, the, I think what they're doing stuff. is they're playing the long, they're playing yeah. the long game. Well, here. they have Fortnite, dude. They have the, they have but the, the money for it. They have the money for yeah. it. They can do, they, they are able to now create more, more platforms and dude, they own the Unreal Engine as well. They're able to, they create I, the majority of the games that. On what, what, what Epic Games is doing is th- I think that they've seen all of this coming from far out mm-hmm. and they're shorting the market. And that's what they've been doing. Good. And that's why everybody like everybody's like, oh, my God, they're so crazy. They're not crazy. They're shorting everything yeah. like they're they're realizing like they're not going to sit here and try to milk a turnip in order to get people to pay like 30, 50 percent of their game sales in order to be on a platform. They realize that the market's crashing. They realize that mm-hmm. everything's getting cheaper. Sure. And what they're doing is they're building practices in anticipation that everything's going to get completely annihilated yeah. <laughs> and they're shorting the market. And it's smart. And that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, that's why it's funny when I say like, you know, people are going to make money both ways. Like when the market crashes, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You've got people like Epic shorting it, and then you've got people like Unity, whatever the opposite of shorting it is. But uh, <laughs> long and and it. <laughs> long, yeah, they're trying to go long, and it's not it's not going to work uh, because you know eventually somebody's going to be right, and I think that's why Unity's panicking. That blog post that Unity wrote was incredibly emotional. Like I for for something to come from an official Unity outlet that was not written by a lawyer that was not written by a representative I was reading it and obviously somebody who was like personally affected or hurt by the situation wrote that and what that means is that they're panicking and that somebody somewhere made a bad decision and they're freaking out and it's because they're long it's because they're long in a market that's crashing you know like that's what happens mm-hmm. when you raise like six hundred million dollars for a freaking competitor that. <laughs> is uh your 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 own people are competing with and right. then you freak out and try to change terms of service to try to undermine them and that backfires because you're long because you're long in a short market like okay yeah. it's good sorry so i i mean I'm, I'm i'm very excited to see what's gonna happen um this year and we're i think we're getting about two hours here so we should probably be wrapping it up here pretty soon um you guys yeah, have... i was just gonna say i had uh two hours and i i'm gonna eat with family tonight so yeah i, would have to, I, sleep I have soon. to go my yeah the, the the wolves are at the the, the gates for me then, so okay. well, uh, i guess we'll just wrap it up here then yeah all right guys uh, upper echelon blue jake thank you both so much for being here it was a great time having you um uh guys i'll have this uploaded like directly after uh i get off here i'm just gonna 
go run some errands in town. I'll have this uploaded for you guys on YouTube. Um, but yo guys, thanks for being here. We'll be doing more industry podcasts in the future, depending on where things go in the industry. I would like to have a industry podcast. That's kind of positive too. One day where we're talking about like a lot of the good shit no, that developers are never. doing only the bad, st- only the bad, I guess that's what only, so it gets only, the views. The only the bad stuff. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Again, uh, so in closing, guys, you know, Blue Drake again, Upper Echelon. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, be sure to go give both these guys a follow on their YouTubes. Fantastic YouTube creators, and they're always talking about shit like this on their streams and as well as YouTube. Uh, so without further ado, guys, peace out. Take care. I'm going to go pass you guys over to somebody, um, and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Yeah, boy. Well, that was fun. Thanks for having me again, Clean.